Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 150. It's a great day. So exciting. Pep, of course, stands for Planet Extra Podcast. It's an offshoot of Planet America on the ABC Australia, which you can see anywhere for the, well, you can't see it anywhere. (laughs) Not for those next two weeks. We're on holiday. Oh, no. So it's an Easter break. So uh, that, that's a waste of time, that little bit of promo. Uh, Pep will be continuing for the next week. We're mm. going to have two next week, actually. I'm going to be so it'll be special guest Pepcaster Richard Cook is returning. That's fantastic. For a triumphant return on, in the, in the, for the first podcast, and then you'll be the second podcast. Yes. And then we're going to take a week off. Great. The uh, For a, I can't think of a. Wordplay off the top of my head <laughs> involving word, the word pep. How about and, respecting right? the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Sure. Yeah. No, that's not very good wordplay, Dave, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> On Pep, we cover all the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. Uh, we are recording this at 2.06 p.m. in Sydney on a Thursday. So it's probably going to be up 36 hours later or so. I'm about a day behind my reading, so that's annoying. Uh, I'm probably going to spend most of Easter catching up. Uh, if you're listening, you can also see this podcast on Facebook and YouTube where you will for you'll see the man who for the last 150 episodes has never raised the stakes on the inconsequential views. I'm talking, of course, about Dr. David Smith. Hello, Dave. That's right. I'm an associate professor at the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney, but I don't speak for either of those institutions, at least not when I'm doing PEP. All that you're getting on PEP is whatever the various little subatomic particles firing in my brain have managed to fire out of my mouth. That's what you're getting. You're not getting anything affiliated with any kind of institution. But I'm going to break that for about 10 seconds. Really? I am going to break it for about 10 seconds. Just for PEP 150? Because I am aware that I actually have students who listen to PEP. So for 10 seconds, I'm going to speak... On behalf of the University of Sydney. What are you going to say? If you're applying for a simple extension, please use the online simple extension portal. Please do not send me an email. It was worth the wait. That's it. (laughs) I'm no longer speaking for the University of Sydney. (laughs) That was so worth the wait. Yes. That was very special for Pep 150. Yes, yeah. Man, they they said we'd never make it, Dave. And when I say they, I mean no one. (laughs) No one's been talking about us. But for the purposes of this podcast, let's pretend they have been. We should. And we overcame the odds. Yeah, 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 we should. Do you remember the uh, the Swan Lager ads? Uh, I do. They said you'd never make it. Yeah. So they made these about uh, Ken. There was one about Ken Doan. Yep. Uh, There was Was one about. Bondi? Bondi? (laughs) <laughs> there should have been one about Bond. <laughs> there was one about the founder of Hamilton Island. Oh, I don't remember that one. Either. Yeah, no, that that was an yeah. unmemorable one. Like I think that you know, there's probably one about Greg Norman. There's one about Daryl Summers. <laughs> oh, that's right. There was two. Yeah, yeah, that I'm, was. I'm still saying he's never going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the best. Should we put these somewhere? Should we show them or? Well, just for Pep 150. Yeah. Look, I, I'll give you a stab at this Daryl Summers one because that's yes, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. the best of the genre. Here yes. we go. They said you'd never make it because your partner is a bird. We think you ought to grow up. Your humor's too absurd They said you'd never make it Hey, you finally came through For all of you who've made it This one's made for you And for the, our American viewers and listeners, you'll be thoroughly confused by what you just heard. I think a lot of our Australian <laughs> viewers are actually going to be thoroughly confused by that <laughs> because, yeah, like yesterday in a lecture, mm. I showed a picture of Don Burke. I was trying to make the point that Australian defamation laws have potentially uh, delayed some of Australia's reckoning mm. with sexual assault in the entertainment industry. Yeah. So I showed a picture of Don Burke. And then it just occurred to me, like, most of the people in that room would have had no idea of who Don Burke was. And were you right? Um, yes, I was right. Yeah. Just judging by the facial expressions. <laughs> uh, yes. 
Yeah, I, I was right. So if you've got no idea who Daryl Summers is, don't worry. That's not your fault. Oh, God. And if you don't know who he is, don't look him up. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, just leave it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, my present to you guys out there for Pep 150, because we, we've received a present of our own, which we're going to talk about soon. Yes. But I have a present back for you to mm. thank you for your 150 uh, episodes of you. And that is, this is going to be a bloodbath free zone. Really? Let's not talk about that bloody story. Okay. <laughs> like I, I hate that story so much. Sure. We talked about it forever on, on uh, Planet America Wednesday. Okay, I'm yeah. Probably gonna bring, I'm probably going to have to mention it with Richard Cook. So let's not talk about it all today. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, give I everyone a break. I wasn't planning on talking about it. You were? No, I wasn't. Oh, good. Fantastic. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. But let's talk about what we're grateful for. Uh, what are you grateful for, Dave? I am grateful for Mel Brooks's classic Blazing Saddles. Oh. Now, Mel Brooks is getting very old and yes. I think he's going to die in the next few years and there'll obviously be a lot of obituaries then. I know one person who is actually responsible for maintaining one of those uh, obituaries, so it's ready to go when he dies. But I think, that, you know, we may as well actually celebrate his work while he's still alive. Uh, Blazing Saddles is, in my view, the funniest American movie ever made. And, wow. you know, this is this is all pretty subjective, yeah, but yeah, sure. that's, you know, that's a, that is just my view. Um, if ever I want to cheer myself up, I just go on YouTube and watch the first five minutes of it, where it, all I can describe it as every syllable is perfectly delivered by every actor. Now, Blazing Saddles is something of a high watermark of political incorrectness, and that's one of the great things about it is that... Uh, you know, people lament, oh, because of political correctness, you can't be funny anymore. They act as if so much great humour has been lost due to political incorrectness. But when you look at Blazing Saddles, you see no one else has ever come close to making p political incorrectness as funny as Blazing Saddles did, mm. right? So most of the, you know, jokes that have been lost due to political incorrectness, they can happily go down the toilet as far as I'm concerned because Blazing Saddles set a standard which is never going to uh, never going to be surpassed. And that is partly because it was co-written by Richard Pryor. Uh, Richard Pryor was, con I think he was believed by studios to have too much baggage to actually star in the movie, so Cleveland Little starred instead and does a fantastic job. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, you know, it's an understatement to say it could never be made, uh, today. Um, but it is an absolutely fantastic movie. I can't quote from it for obvious re for the reasons that I've just been talking about. <laughs> um, uh, yes, but, uh, it is, uh, it's an amazing movie and, um, yeah, apart from the fact that you can't quote it, it is one of the most quotable movies of all time. So when, when the Fogey documentaries come for you to get you to complain about Comedy of today and what you can't say. Yeah, yeah. You're just going to talk about Blazing Saddles. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, 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 I also really rate Blazing Saddles. I thought it was a very funny movie as well. Yes. I would, I would probably disagree with you. Wouldn't you say that's the height of political in in incorrectness? I'd mm -hmm. say the height of political incorrectness was when. Kramer had like a, an aneurysm and just started <laughs> saying the N-word over and over and <laughs> yeah, over that, again. That, that, yeah. that, that was equally funny for me, but <laughs> not intentionally so. <laughs> that, that's okay. By the way, that's that's not some lost episode of Seinfeld that Chase is referring to. That's when Michael Richards was doing stand-up <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, responded rather poorly to a heckler. It was the height of political incorrectness. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. South Park actually did quite a funny episode about that. Everything about that. Speaking of funny. the height of... Yeah, anyway. Uh, well, I'm grateful for I'm grateful for a couple of things. First of all, these presents. I refer yes. to the present. These, these mugs right here. Have a look at that. There we are. And around there, let's get peppy. They were sent to us by Neil. Best present ever, Neil. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much. Neil. He sent us a box full of these lovely we pet mugs. We are very grateful for that. Yeah, we're crawling our way to having our own merch, one gift at a time. Right? <laughs> the way things are going... If Neil keeps it up, we'll have merch by Pep 200. <laughs> uh, honestly, Neil, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, I don't really know how to process that kind of niceness. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's, it was it's very, a, very touching. It frazzles my circuitry, yes, but it yeah. was appreciated. So thank you, Neil. I'm also grateful for one other thing, which is Pepfar. Um, the house seemingly are doing normal things for just a little while. Mm. And uh, they seem to be passing a budget, which is nice. Mm. Um, they're talking about finally getting the foreign aid. That would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and here's a the beauty. They finally gave a clean extension to PEPFAR. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, 
PEPFAR is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. It provides free AIDS medication to poor countries, mm -hmm. su supports AIDS orphans, allows children of mothers who have AIDS to be born without the AIDS, which is a nice thing for them. It builds education systems in AIDS-affected communities. Essentially, it not only treats AIDS patients yeah, in yeah. Africa, but it also treats their families and their communities. And despite being called PEPFAR and definitely having our endorsement, <laughs> it's not actually related to us. No, no. It's, uh, it, it started a little bit before us. Yes. It's, it's actually started by George Do George W. Bush. Mm. I, I think you could arguably say it was the best thing he did. Yeah. Arguably, I think. I yeah. think so. In fact, I would say inarguably. But uh, yeah. it's definitely right up there. Um, over 20 years, it saved 25 million lives in 55 countries. As I said, mostly Africa. AIDS deaths have dropped 64% in the countries in which PEPFAR operated. Mm. Uh, recently, though, it's been under threat. You might go, why would that be under threat? Mm. Uh, yeah, this is where we come to Congress. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> Congress. Yeah. PEPFAR often works with non-profits on the ground. Mm. And uh, and conservatives have been worried recently that some of those non-profits might conduct abortions. Now, let they may well. Let, let's be clear here, though. Um, of course, you know, some medical professionals on the ground would be mm. doing everything. Yes. Because there aren't. There aren't, they're not yeah. overwhelmed with medical professionals in some of these countries. Mm. Uh, and uh, like no one is suggesting that PEPFAR explicitly is promoting abortion no. or that PEPFAR is out there themselves conducting abortions mm. or funding it, whatever, but they're, they're working with people and funding people who also, yeah. some of them, conduct abortions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and so conservatives are saying if you can't guarantee that, that they won't do that, then we are indirectly funding abortion and we won't fund PEPFAR. That's been the, the threat. Um, now, that's ridiculous because faith-based organisations are all over this industry. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, depending on the country, it could mm. be anything from 30 to 70% of the organisations involved in this are religious organisations. Yes. But yeah, in the countries where it's 30% rather than 70%, if you cut out the, everyone else, mm. you would – significantly compromise it the would. quality of care. Yes. Which is why PEPFAR has been refusing to back down yes. in this particular respect. Uh, anyway, in the deal that the House just agreed to, they gave up the concern. They mm. extended PEPFAR with a clean extension for another year, which is good news, and I am grateful for that. Yes. So, yeah, I'd be more Me grateful too. if it was a five-year extension rather than a one-year extension. Yeah, yeah, but... I'll take what I can get. Mm. Okay. Correspondence. There's a stack of 150 correspondence okay. here. Okay. I'll try and rattle through it, as always. Yes. Biden correspondence. A few people said that on the grab I played last week where Biden responded to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? I played that and I said, I said that I thought he said illegals at the end. How many thousands have been killed yeah, yeah. by illegals? And you said, I think, I think he's saying legals. Yes. And like, and if you listen over and over and over again, it's kind of like it's a, uh, there, but it's just, it's just a, like a half an uh, It's just yeah, yeah. unclear. Yeah. The peppers are on your side. Oh, okay. Like, Terror 1983, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the fact checkers are on your side. Okay. Like I, I looked it up and the fact, that, and uh, there have been yeah, a, yeah. a few fact checks about this. The reason there have been a few fact checks about this is because a lot of people are unsure about what he said. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot of people have said, is it illegals? Is it legals? Uh, I think it's the rhythm and intonation of illegals, but if you listen carefully, D, David does say it differently yeah, than yeah. how he said illegal. I mean, before. <laughs> legals is a weird way to refer to the category of everybody who is not an undocumented immigrant. There is that as well. But my, but either way, my point still stands, yeah, which yeah. is if he's unclear enough that there's confusion, yes. then it's clearly not effective communication. Mm. And what my point was at the time was it didn't matter. Yes. It didn't cost him. He could be unclear. It didn't matter. Maybe he was talking about paralegals. <laughs> Maybe. That is the third option. That's the third way. Uh, anyway, so but I want to acknowledge that yep. pretty much all the peppers agree with you. Dave. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, talking about which on this, uh, Christian writes on the, Bi the Biden thing. Chaz, yep. I'm confused. When you say Biden has to get out there, which is what, yep. my, my takeaway from this, mm -hmm. last year you proved with polls how Biden and Trump perform better when they, when they lose their profile and get unpopular mm. when they are overexposed. Am I misremembering? And – First of all, it's always shocking when someone pays enough attention to us <laughs> to actually catch us in a contradiction months later. Yes. <laughs> That's, that is amazing. Thank and, you. We appreciate it. And it's scary. Yes. Uh, but uh, to, to answer your question, though, Christian, like there are often 
contradictory concerns in politics, mm. obviously. Uh, like, for instance, we might be talking about about Gaza obliquely later on. Uh, that's, a, that's a perfect situation where there are two conflicting groups that Biden is trying to service at the same time. That is you, exactly what you, we'll be talking about, yeah, yes. You can't service both of them. Yes. At least not at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and this is definitely a contradiction. Uh, polling has shown that, as you say, Christian, over time is very consistent. The more these two hide, the better they do. No mm. doubt about that. But if Biden hides, it creates more concern about why he's hiding. And age is his greatest concern of all at the moment. Mm. So one contradicts the other. Um, so to me, it's a question of what's the biggest fire that he needs to put out at any given moment. And I would say the age is the biggest fire. So he should get out more. Now, yep. it is going to compromise him in the other respect, but I don't know what else you can do. What are your thoughts? Well, in that respect, there's no way that Trump is going to be hiding, no matter how good it would be for him. So, yeah, may, uh, I, it could hurt him, uh, him being out there, but I think that Chaz is right about the fact he, he has to take the, the age issue head on. Um, and just hope that Trump exposes himself a lot more. Yeah, and yeah. as you say, that's a pretty solid hope. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, Wonka Correspondence. Wonka Simon, Correspondence, still uh, going. That's my favourite correspondence. Yes, yeah. Simon says there's a musical in the works based oh, on the Willy Wonka debacle. Okay, we all knew someone <laughs> was going to take this too far. Are you sure that's too far? Though? Well, yes. Uh, so our Planet Britain uh, correspondent, Gareth, who we have mentioned before, yes. uh, he sent me a link to the uh, Channel 5, yeah. which is like the crappiest cheap TV channel channel mm. in Planet Britain, mm. uh, had an hour-long documentary called, I can't remember, something, you know, Willie's Chocolate Experience, The Scandal That Rocked Britain. <laughs> Rock their socks off, you mean. Yeah, cool. <laughs> to call it a scandal. Mm. Like, a, a scandal to me, that is about something where there were high expectations that were, <laughs> were dashed in a morally discomforting way. Yeah. This to me does not qualify as a scandal. <laughs> no, probably, <laughs> um, probably not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, apparently it was actually um, it was worth watching for the interview with Billy Cool because you just see how far in he is over his head. Um, is it online? I might search for it. I think it is. I think uh, L sent me a link to it. I, I don't think it was a link to that or a link just to a story about it where he talks about this has destroyed my life, I lost all my friends. And, I mean, to you've, me. You've gained me, Billy Cool. Well, I suspect, no, I suspect no one's ever going to read his novels now. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, look, yeah, it was like we got a good half hour of pep. Oh, we certainly did. Well, out of, out of this. Well, the point Simon makes is we might get more because he's <laughs> suggesting this might be an excuse for an all expenses paid trip to produce a local oh, version geez. of the first episode Look, of Planet Britain. I, <laughs> I was concerned as soon, as soon as I saw this, and as soon as the initial laugh died down, I thought, "Oh fuck, someone's going to do a nine part Netflix <laughs> series." About this, I'll watch the shit out of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, the, the Guardian review of this uh, this one hour documentary uh, said it just had it was just one hour of someone over explaining the joke. Uh, yeah, but I'll still watch it. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is that the, the whole experience from beginning to end went three hours. Yes. So you have to have it in real slow motion yes. to make it last nine. Yeah, yeah. But that's okay. Billy Cool does claim that the first few runs through actually went well, but he said yeah. that then, then suddenly there's all these angry parents there. <laughs> sure, Billy. <laughs> um, look, I think it's a great suggestion from Simon myself, even if you poo-poo it. And I say to, to our friend Neil, if you want the, the next present, maybe uh, <laughs> maybe maybe all expenses paid trip to uh, uh, Planet Britain dear. for the musical just putting it out there. Um, but, uh, uh, another random one here from Simon. Hi, Chaz. I just wanted to say I'm grateful for whoever uploaded all the episodes of CNN End to the Chaser YouTube page. I miss its original run, so I'm looking forward to catching up. Yeah. Now, I share that with you because I didn't know that, that they did that. I don't know who from the Chaser lo uploaded that, but I'm grateful too because I lost the DVDs years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch them as well. They actually, I reckon they hold up okay. So some of the shows we made... Did not hold up okay. But yeah, I yeah. I reckon they were held up all right. I've only got the vaguest memories of the original run. Oh, of, you can watch it all now. Don't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. It's all on YouTube there. Uh, of, yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it, this was like a, the Chase's first show. It was like a parody of Twenty Four Hour News. Yeah, um, and I always wish we'd made it ten years later. Did you have there was one in Martin Place of getting people to assault a mannequin of Kim Beasley? That's really early on. Yes, yes, yes. yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that was actually on our election show. I don't think I was seeing. That oh, one. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like episode two of any television. Yes, because I distinctly remember uh, our friend Aaron Timms stopping by mm-hmm. and giving the the. Kim Beasley mannequin and nipple cripple. It was anatomically correct. As that well. is my, <laughs> that's my strongest memory. Yes. Of that. Well, um, well, now you can. Well, they, well, this is not seen in the end, but you yes. can go and watch the end. I was really surprised that they that they loaded it up, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, incidentally, one of the things I'm proudest of that I've written in my career was mm. in seeing the end. I wrote a a uh, series of uh, cosmetic company ads called Esteem. The company was called Esteem. <laughs> and when you watch it, or if you watch it, you'll see it comes off as real angry because I hate those ads so much. <laughs> I hate the entire industry. And I just did it with a fury. You know, you, when you, you, know, you can just imagine me researching with a fury. Mm, yeah, That's oh, what yes. I did. <laughs> and, and, then just, and I um, I was really proud of those ads. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it was a... It's a little bit of a shame there had to be a guy who wrote the, wrote them because the chaser had all guys. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I was proud of it. I was proud mm. of the result. Anyway, thank you, Simon, for pointing that out. Obama correspondence from Neil. This Neil. Thank hey. you, Neil. You mentioned that Obama hollowed out the Democratic Party and it affected the Dems for years after. Could you help me understand why he did this? Was he not aware of the consequences? Now, he's, Neil's asking us to read minds there a bit. Yeah, look, Do I don't... Thoughts? No, well... First of all, um, uh, yes, he was not aware of the consequences mm. of what he was doing by um, moving parts of it around to the uh, – sorry, what's his foundation called? Uh, it was, uh, organizing for America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, like, yeah, yeah, no, no, he wouldn't have been aware mm. of what he was doing. If he, if he knew what the electoral consequences of that mm. uh, would have been, he wouldn't have been aware. But it wasn't just him at that mm. point. Uh, Obama was seen as the Democratic Party. Yeah. You know, he was seen as the best thing that had happened to the Democratic Party for years. He was the future of the Democratic Party. After that election win in 2008, where Democrats had 60 Senate seats and I don't know how many House seats, you've got to remember how invincible um, Obama and the Democrats actually seemed at that point and how yeah linking the two things together just seemed to be so very important yeah so yeah. it it wasn't just him um yeah, yeah i was just i was going to say that uh, i think i think especially younger people may not realize just what the vibe was yes, at that yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. it's hard to believe now yeah. that there were people lots of people walking around the street with t-shirts that said hope Yes. Can you imagine anyone wearing a T-shirt that says hope yeah, in 2024? Yeah. Yeah. Like it was such a, a an exciting, yeah, inspirational yeah. time, mm. like where people thought things were possible and people actually were, like thought Obama was going to make this huge difference. Yeah, yeah. Like just, and obviously that idealism lasted like a year yeah. at that, best. I mean, I, like I remember that election night mm. in Ann Arbor and after watching it at this big party at a friend's place then I went back to a bar downtown which was packed with people and I talk about there's about to be an impromptu parade staged through the middle mm. of an Ann Arbor <laughs> at midnight mm. on, a, on a winter night. Mm. Um, that, that kind of lack of cynicism now is just incredible given this is the university campus that recently registered a 50% uncommitted vote against uh, against Joe Biden. Like this is, this is a campus that uh, in terms of its political activism is generally way to the left of the Democratic Party mainstream. Um, yeah, like that's what the atmosphere was at that time. So it's... That it, it seemed like a logical thing to do at the time. And there was a lot of discourse around then that, um, you know, he was taking the Democratic Party in a new direction and political parties as we understood them were kind of a thing of the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. And uh, also it turns out that political organising is very hard. Yes, it does. And, and it's hard to do, especially when you're president. Yes. They, and, it's, and it's just a fact that, yeah. There were too many things that jobs to perform and not enough people to do it. Yeah, yeah. And the idealism really didn't last long. Mm. And uh and I think they just overreached. Yep. At the totally. uh, and uh and it turned out the daggy old DNC actually performed real functions. Yep. <sighs> so uh they learnt that a bit too late. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's my thoughts and your thoughts. Yes. Yeah. Okay, legal correspondence from Warrior Queen. Apparently last week, Dave, I didn't actually check this, but I'm trusting yeah. you, Warrior. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you said that Cannon dismissed the claim against the Espionage Act with prejudice. She says it was actually without prejudice. Oh, okay. Um, I I can't remember that at yeah. all. I I may have said if I did say that, I'm I freely admit that I don't know what I was talking. about. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I, yeah, yeah. Because I can't. Uh, I ca- I cannot. Uh, Reconstruct my thinking on that. So I, I'm happy to take whatever correction. I, comes I'm not my bringing way. this up to bash you. Yeah, I'm yeah. bringing this up just to yeah, yeah. just uh, just because Warrior Queen makes the makes yep. the point yeah, that yes. it's important because after the jury's sworn in, Trump can raise that objection again. Ah, and okay. if Cannon agrees, right. then all 32 charges of Trump illegally holding defense secrets will be dropped. Okay, this decision is not appealable, and under double jeopardy rules, Trump cannot be recharged with these crimes. So she says, "So I'd withhold your gratefulness to Judge Cannon. I very much doubt it will." <laughs> okay. Age well. Okay. Yeah. Now, look, I'm not 100 percent sure of the full level of analysis that I just read out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're interested, Warrior Queen does say that it did cite two podcasts where she heard them talk about this. So mm. if you're interested, okay. um, she says the, the latest Prosecuting Donald Trump podcast uh, called Two Steps Forward, One Step Back discusses the issue from the 22 minute 30 mark. And the latest Jack episode, uh, 68 Judicial Glosses is the episode, discusses it from the start. If you're curious, you can follow that up. Okay. I don't know why we're, we're promoting other podcasts. I'm really bad at this job. <laughs> Um, and the and she's certainly correct about the gratitude not aging well. That's for sure. Because yeah. uh, Eileen Cannon's been up to her old tricks this week. She has been. I'm not going to talk about it today because this is one of those stories I think we're, we're going to have a better idea about yep. in a couple of days. Yes. So I'll save it for the for the for next week. Yep. But yeah, she's. We'll be talking about her. Okay. <laughs> Adam Sandler correspondence day. <laughs> This comment of the week from John. I yeah. love this comment. Yes. Hi, hi, Chad. Zuma here. I disagree with your comment that pop culture revolves around old people. As I would instead say that pop culture no longer revolves around movies. Ah. Here's a list of the top 10 highest grossing YouTube stars in 2021. Okay. They make just as much as the biggest movie stars yep. and they're nearly all millennials or Zoomers. Very good point. Don't just mean YouTubers, but I like also Twitch, TikTok and such. Of course, he is 100% right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> movies, of course, revolve around the 1990s and noughts. Yes. Because the people who watch movies are from the 1990s and noughts. That's right. That makes perfect sense. And young people have a completely different source of entertainment. That is an excellent point. Excellent point. And we, obviously, Dave, are too old to think of that, yep. even though I literally only watch YouTube these days instead <laughs> of TV. So thank you for the corrective, John. Also, on the... Kind of on more Sandler correspondence. I didn't more think, Sandler I, I didn't correspondence. think there'd be this much yep. uh, from Jake. Speaking of Adam Sandler as a serious actor, the yes. role of Sergeant Donnie Donowitz in Inglorious oh, yes. yeah, yeah, was actually written by Quentin Tarantino for Sandler, apparently. Yes. yes, it was. But he was shooting funny people at the time. Yes. So there we so go. So I went to Eli Roth instead. Who did, Eli Roth did a very good job yeah. of it. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, I have heard that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll bring it up, A, because that's interesting trivia. But yes. secondly, because Inglorious Bastards is yet another one of the many movies that deserved the Best Movie Award in 2009, more than Avatar did, Bill, <laughs> if you're watching this podcast. <laughs> there, there, was a, there was a source of contention in our last right, podcast. Right, yes, yeah, that, yeah. That He felt Avatar deserved the Best Picture. Yeah, yeah. Oscar. No, it's it's my second favourite Tarantino movie. What's your favourite? Jackie Brown. I love Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown is so good. So underrated. It is, and yeah. it's the only one that – is based on source material that wasn't actually written by Tarantino himself. Mm. Uh, and I wish he had actually done more that were based on not his own original source because it, it brought out some other dimension of his creativity, mm. I feel. But, yeah. If you haven't seen Jackie Brown, I bet you haven't. Go watch it. It is, well, if you're from the 90s or noughts. Yeah. Uh, it is It is a really complete movie. It is. Yeah, it's Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Probably because it wasn't written by Tarantino. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Snapchat correspondence. Pencil says, I haven't <laughs> used Snapchat since I was 18 in t- 2014, but I teach teens acting classes. It seems like it's used for the same thing that it was then, which was sending random pictures of your face back and forth all day with a <laughs> caption. The timeout and automatic deletion of the image after 10 seconds or after viewing makes kids feel safer, so there's likely some sexting going on mm. there as well. Certainly was in my day. However, it seems like she, she's 28 and she's saying my day. However, it seems like people age out of Snapchat, which makes it unique amongst the other services didn't, you described. Didn't Snapchat disappear at some point? I've got no idea. I've I never think it disappeared Snapchat. and came back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised there was never a satanic pa- uh, panic-esque panic about uh, Snapchat, but it may be that's one of the ones that parents don't notice. Mm. Um, by the way, 
for those uh, my own little correspondence with my daughter, I asked my 14 year old daughter who she thinks uses Snapchat. Yep. And she said, complete bitches do. <laughs> so uh, it sounds like she's got some issues that aren't for this podcast that I need to talk to her about. <laughs> some stories she might like to share about her experience with people who use Snapchat. Mm. But, uh, anyway, take what you will from but that. But look, I think that is <laughs> that is something that should have gone on that graphic in the demographics. <laughs> yes. Yes. Snapchat. Okay, I would you. like to see the polling of complete bitches <laughs> and what, what, what uh, social media they like to use. And then we get to the final one, the TikTok correspondence. Lots on that. Okay. I don't think... There are, there are quite a few people who weren't thrilled with our TikTok <laughs> takes. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. they want to see it divested. Uh, it, well, it wasn't necessarily clear. They just disagreed with some of our arguments. Uh, okay, and I'll right. just throw a couple of you quickly. Marcus yeah, yeah. says, Dave, given that in China one cannot access Google, Facebook, Twitter, or basically any American media service mm-hmm. unless yep. it agrees to censor any criticism yes, yeah. of the CCP, why should they allow Chinese platforms unfettered access to the American market? The, the fact that this is what China does, therefore we should give them a taste of their own medicine, uh, mm. to me is not a good way of making a legal framework around social media. Yes, it's absolutely true that mm. uh, China censors all of this stuff. Uh, that doesn't have any effect at all on uh, you, you know what it is Americans should be or should not be watching. So, like, yeah, of course I'm fully aware of, uh, of, of that, but I just don't think that... Um, that is any grounds uh, at all to um, uh, yeah to make public policy. I would add to that that I personally see free speech as a good in itself. Yes, yeah. It's not just like a trade off with other countries. No, no. And so I know it's not a fashionable view these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that yeah, it, like it's to China's detriment that they don't do that. Yeah. And there's no reason why America should handicap itself. Because yes. China is handicapping itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and by the way, it, it's kind of interesting the language that you use, unfettered, mm. a, this Chinese price is unfettered access to mm. the US market. And one of the reasons why that's interesting is because there's a long history of in US-China trade, um, these arguments about like this product is so much cheaper to make in China, it's going to cheaply flood the US market, mm. why should they have unfettered access to our market? I'm reading a fantastic book about this at the moment by Elizabeth Ingelson called Made in China, which traces this all the way back to the 1970s. But the thing is here we're talking about free social media platforms, mm. right? We're not talking about price competition. Yeah. So the reason why it's got unfettered access to the American market is because Americans like it. Yes. <laughs> yes. That yeah, is, uh... the answer. The answer to that is make a better social media platform. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they will. But uh, no, they won't. In the meantime, no, they won't because it's Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk in charge of it. There's always someone Even if else. they could remotely understand oh. what a better social media platform actually looked like, they wouldn't make it. When I say they will, I don't mean tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, this is the nature of social media. Yeah, There'll yeah. be another one. Yeah, yeah. There always is. Uh, Mammy, on the, on the idea of removing the app, and I said it yes. won't end it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mammy said, Chaz, I think you're wrong that delisting TikTok from app stores will bolster its popularity or not actually be a big deal because Android and iPhones have a duopoly in America to get the app or updates to the app onto users' phones. Android users need to specifically download the APK file and bypass a bunch of huge warning notifications that's not an officially distributed app, which will scare off most users. Hmm. And on iPhones, there's no official way to sideload an app outside the App Store. You have to jailbreak your iPhone first, a process which is constantly changing due to constant iOS updates. Hmm. At least for iPhone users, China ByteDance will have no way to reach iPhones if it's delisted. Now, you might be right, Mammy, but I just want to explain, well, first of all, I was thinking, A, it's already on a lot of phones. Mm. So as long as China doesn't create a need for updates, it can just stay there for a bunch of phones. But doesn't everything need to be updated all the time? Does it? That's an interesting question. I often wonder this when (laughs) I'm plagued by annoying (laughs) updates. I'm like, you really need to do this? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. I don't know, maybe. Um, but as for new users, while I was, I referred to it like a Chinese server. What I meant, because a few people were confused about what I was talking about. Yeah. What I meant was right now on my phone, mm. I can set up a web shortcut. Right. To say Twitter. Yeah. And I can use web Twitter on my phone. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Instead of a Twitter app, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I see no reason why now this bill would stop there being an American server, an American website mm. for TikTok. But I see no reason why China couldn't set up their own website for yeah, American okay. TikTok. Yep. The people could then use the web shortcut. Sure. And so new people who don't have the app or just become a, basically yes. a web app that you use on your phone but through through a web shortcut. That, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Now, maybe I'm completely wrong. Yep. I got no idea. But uh, I, I probably am. But that's what I was thinking. So, yes. so if someone can 
can actually give me some info on that, yeah. I will I will update that uh, later on. But the, the point that you make about digital locks is a really good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the ways in which Apple parasitically manages to take a huge cut out of uh, out of every single app mm. uh, while doing basically nothing in return. And there's a fantastic book about this called Choke Point Capitalism by Cory Doctorow and I think it's Rebecca Giblin. Is that going on the... Oh, that's absolutely going okay. on the reading list, so, yes. So, okay, so the reading list is on the in the blurb on Facebook and YouTube. Yep. Choke Point Capitalism. I'm yes. putting it there right now. Good. Yeah. And then also on TikTok, uh, Nick uh, had... A rare stat correction. Oh, not correction, but but extra stat. I always love these. These are my favourite comments. Yep, yep, yep. Nick says, regarding your point about getting news from the app, I think your stats might be a little off. Ah. 14% total adults, yes. But 32% of 18 to 29s, i.e. people who are actually on the platform, that's a lot and it's growing. I did cite that. But Mm -hmm. this is the thing he adds. Yes. Looking specifically at users... Right. Rather than adults or, or, or children in oh, general. Oh, I see, I see, yeah, it yeah. It was 43% of all users last year and trending up who use TikTok for news. Okay. So uh, he's, especially with comp- competitors like Facebook deliberately deprioritizing news, mm. seems likely to me that trend will continue. A lot of people are getting news from TikTok already. A lot more will do so in the next few years. That's a golden stat, Nick. I, I've, I'm glad to share that. I will concede completely. That is a very, very good point. Yeah, great point, Nick. Well done. Yes. Uh, On that note, a few things I saw this week I want to add to this topic before we get to the new content. Uh, TikTok is particularly prominent in the Hispanic community. Mm. 49% of Hispanic adults use TikTok compared to 33% of total adults, which is interesting. Also, 40% of women versus 25% of men. Okay. So there we go. Yep. Uh, to my point before about the app aging out a bit, TikTok US average monthly users aged 18 to 24 declined by 9% from 2022 to 2023. Right, which okay. Is interesting. Yep. But those who use it, use it a lot. The average teen user spends an hour and a half on it every single day, mm. according to Gallup in 2023. Yep. And which is interesting because in China, kids under 14 aren't even allowed to use it more than 40 minutes a day. Right. And they're not allowed to use it at all between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., mm. which is interesting. Also, I want to add about surveillance. I knew that Chinese TikTok had some issues with surveilling Hong Kong. I didn't know that in 2022, ByteDance employees were caught surveilling US journalists oh. who were reporting on TikTok through their apps. Several employees were fired for that. Also, TikTok employees shared US user data on a messaging system in 2021. So this is all pre-Project Texas. Yep. I'm not sure if this, this would still apply or not, but you'd want to make sure that Project Texas can guarantee that won't happen. Mm. Anyway, regardless of what happens with TikTok, it might be a good idea at least for Congress to mandate data localization for all companies, yep. I would have thought, so you don't have these issues. Yes. But one more thing I forgot on the pro-TikTok side. We were only talking about speech last week. What we forgot is that 7 million TikTok users derive either part or all of their income from businesses on TikTok. Mm. So if you got rid of TikTok, if something happened to TikTok, yeah, yeah. you're screwing a lot of people. Yes. Like they can't just take their users to a new platform. Yeah, 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 yeah. So ideally you would avoid doing that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's a lot of people that you're screwing over. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I just flagged that as well. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, anything to add to any of that? Look, I would just say um, there have been some excellent points made. All, all of those pieces of correspondence mm. made some very good points. Mm. Um, none of them are going to change my position. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, now we're going to skip around all over the place because Dave's got got the, an hour and 20 minutes left. Yes. And we have way more than that and I want to finish before uh, Easter. <laughs> literally, literally someone has just commented about Octordle. You were asking before about people commenting about Wordle. Yes. Yes, we have definitely our re- our viewers are into Wordle. Um yeah, I got I want to try to get get a whole bunch of stuff finished before Easter because I'm like Before that. Jesus rises. <laughs> yes. Well, I cannot rest yes. until that moment. Okay, yeah. Uh and so I'm going to I'm going to have a little Chaz unleash probably after both this one and the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, let's get as much of stuff involving you as possible. Okay. Yes, yeah. Kevin Rudd. Okay. This is very important because whenever Australia is in the news, it is. Yeah, it becomes very it important. It is. <laughs> Another one of my favourite movies is Mad Max Fury Road, mm-hmm. which I think it's only got something like four pages of dialogue in the entire movie, but all the dialogue that's in it is extremely quotable. And one of my <laughs> favourite lines is when Max, played by Tom Hardy, is uh, driving along and he says, That is bait. Mm. 
as soon as I saw this, I'm like, that is bait. <laughs> so if you're unfamiliar with <laughs> what happened, and I'm sure that you're not, uh, so Nigel Farage was interviewing Donald Trump mm. on GB News. Mm. GB News is one of the few media outlets in the world that rates worse than Sky News Australia. <laughs> Some shows on GB News rate so lowly that they're actually given a zero rating. Um, now, Nigel Farage, to his credit, is the most popular presenter on GB News. Like, he's the only one who, who cracks, uh, like, 50,000. Um, uh, so, yeah, his show. Nigel Farage, of course, was um, he was the leader of UKIP uh, for a while. I should just jump in th- yeah, just yeah. quickly. When you're saying 50,000 being the highest yes. rating one and that most, some of them rate zero, yeah, yeah. this is in the UK, right? Yes, it is the UK. UK, yes. which has... The largest TV market in the world. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like even though even though America yeah, yeah. has a much higher population, everyone in the UK watches TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that is incredible. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Go on. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, he resigned from UKIP in 2018 to uh, lead the Brexit Party, which actually in 2019 was the third big. It just in terms of the number of votes it got was the third biggest party mm. in Britain. Although it didn't get any, uh, didn't get any parliamentary seats. Um, he it, now I'm his political influence has declined somewhat mm. since then uh, because last thing I knew he was one of the contestants on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. Uh, by the way, George Galloway has also been on that, and he's going back to Parliament now. There you go. Yeah, a little bit of Planet Britain for you. But anyway, <laughs> now he's the most popular host on GB News and so long-term ally of Donald Trump. Mm. And uh, he asked this question and he said, this one is from our friends at Sky News Australia. And it has subsequently turned out it was actually the CEO of Sky News Australia, Paul Whitaker, who wrote this question mm. um, and saying, well, first of all, talking about the AUKUS deal and how great it was, which I can't imagine Trump would have been that interested in that because he had nothing to do with the AUKUS deal. If uh, he did, it wouldn't have been called the AUKUS deal. No, no, <laughs> certainly would not. Um, and they say, oh, well, we've got a Labor government now and they've appointed this this ambassador, Kevin Rudd, who said horrible things about you. Mm. Uh, you called you a traitor to the West. Uh, you know, like, what do you think about that? Now, it's pretty obvious from Trump's reaction that he had either never heard of Kevin Rudd before, or if he had heard of it, it would have been because one of his Australian super fans who was on some kind of pilgrimage to Mar a Lago had probably talked his ear off about mm. Kevin Rudd, but he wouldn't have been paying any attention. So it may have, may have uh, you know, rung a very distant bell mm. somewhere, but it was a pretty rote response from yeah. Trump saying, oh, well, if that's true, he's not going to last very long uh, if I become president. He's a dim bulb. He's, he's a dim, dim he, well, he said, I, I've heard he's a nasty piece of work and uh, not the brightest bulb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, that doesn't necessarily mean that he recognised who Kevin Rudd was. Of course he didn't know. That, who he yeah, was. yeah, that could have just been, <laughs> yeah. Um, and but what what uh, the the quote that he's referring to is when uh, Rudd referred to him as a traitor to the West mm. uh, following the uh, following the January six attacks. Now, um, I got a lot of media requests to talk about this <laughs> yesterday because that's bait. Yes. Yeah, uh, and. Like, you know, Sky News obviously got what it wanted out of this, mm. which is a chance to talk about itself for the next uh, two days mm. and uh, and its importance. Um, in terms of the actual importance of this, though, because I was getting asked a lot yesterday, so does this mean that Kevin Rudd can't be the ambassador if, uh, if, if Trump is president? By the way, I did an interview um, on 5AA in Adelaide with Matthew Pantelis and... One of the things, uh, I was talking to someone else at the USSC about this, one of the things about doing these uh, local radio spots is that while you're on hold, you get to hear the local ads. Ah. And let me tell you, they're pretty damn local in (laughs) Adelaide. I think the first ad I heard was for a fresh nuts and chocolate business, (laughs) which its main selling point is we are proudly South Australian owned, fourth generation, you know, so come and get some nuts. Uh, then the next ad was for a funeral home, which is also proudly South Australian owned. <laughs> um, sure. Anyways, sorry, just a little uh, little visit to Planet South Australia I, there. I wouldn't, wouldn't even imagine going to a Victorian human, uh, funeral home. 
<laughs> no. or a Queensland funeral home, a Tasmanian funeral home. Just imagine it. No. <laughs> it just wouldn't be the same. No. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Anyway, so, uh, but one of the things I got asked a lot yesterday, yes, was, okay, could, so could Kevin Rudd be ambassador if yes. Trump was president? And the first, obviously, the first thing to clean up is it's not as if Trump could just send Rudd home. No. Unless he did take the extraordinary step of de- declaring him persona non grata under the Vienna Convention, <laughs> uh, which would be a serious diplomatic rift between the two countries. And I, I, well, let's not rule that out, but yeah. <laughs> unlikely. <Yeah. laughs> unlikely, right. So it's ob- it is obviously a decision of the Australian government mm. and, of course, of Rudd himself. And it's actually, it, 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 I think Rudd himself would be the major decision maker here, right? Mm. So there is a precedent for this. And that is Kim Darrick, who was the UK ambassador to the US um, from, I, th- I think it was from 2015 to 2019. Mm. Um, so he was there during Trump's election campaign. He's got a very interesting um, memoir about this called Collateral Damage, where he ob- observes the rise of Trump. Now, what happened with Kim Darrick is he was writing very frank assessments um, back to... London of, uh, of of Trump, um, uh, yeah, described him in uh, in quite unflattering terms. Um, I think might have described him as insecure at mm. one point. That's the sort of thing that uh, you know uh, really sort of pushes the buttons. Um, this got leaked. I think it's it's believed that a twenty one year old member of the Brexit Party was uh, responsible for the leak. Uh, got splashed all over the first five pages of the Daily Mail mm. uh, in a way that basically guaranteed there had to be a response from uh, from Trump. And the response from Trump was, well, uh, you know, nobody really likes that guy here. <laughs> uh, and he, once again, probably d- didn't actually know who he, mm. he was. He's done a very bad job, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Now, the British government, so I think Theresa May was the Prime Minister at that time, said... They were 100% behind him. And actually, Boris Johnson was, at that point, the Foreign Secretary. And Boris Johnson assured him he was 100% behind Derek. Derek made the decision himself to step down because he thought he wouldn't be able to do the job because Trump's staff and Trump's cabinet wouldn't trust him. Right, because now they've seen what kind of things he's writing back to London. Mm. He thought they would be very wary of actually uh, talking to him at all. And given the sort of Trumpian imperative of enforcing loyalty, they wouldn't want to be seen as betraying Trump by dealing with this guy. So it was Derek's own decision that he just wouldn't be able to do his yeah. job properly. Um, I think Rudd would have to be at least considering similar things. Mm. I reckon... Rudd would actually have no problem at all repairing his relationship with Trump because, frankly, Trump is surrounded by people who have said way worse yeah. things than him. He's going to say one nice thing yes. and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yes, Trump does have, uh, you know, an amazing capacity to hold a lot of grudges at once, but we've also seen these can be quite easily wiped mm. away uh, as, as long as you do the bare minimum to make Trump feel that you respect him, mm. right? So... Um, I don't think that there'd actually be a, tr- uh, a problem with Rudd repairing relations. The other thing is this quote isn't a new... Like, th- these have been known for a long time. These mm. have been known ever since Rudd actually was appointed ambassador. He's been asked about this repeatedly. Mm. Like, most recently, uh, Tom Manier, who's the US correspondent for the Herald Sun, interviewed him uh, just a couple of months ago and was asking him about this. And, you know, Rudd's said, like, well, it's the right of the American people to elect who they want. I can work with whoever. Um, and, he's, you know, he's been working to, to build ties with, uh, with Republicans. So I don't have any doubt that Rudd would be able to deal with Trump. The problem, as I see it, would be this. Um, you know, Trump has promised to clean out the US government and fill it with his own personal loyalists. I think it could be very difficult for Rudd to deal with those loyalists, mm. uh, not least because we now know they would have their friends at Sky News Australia constantly in their ears saying you can't deal with this uh, with this Rudd guy. Like it's, it's it's pretty clear there are people in Australia who um, I I don't know if it's the correct word to say they loathe Rudd or just that they see deep pleasure in uh, you know in hurting Rudd. Uh, that that would constantly be trying to move this back to the uh, the, the front of the agenda. Um, interesting little uh, historical roundabout in all of this was that after Trump got elected, 
within a few days, so while he was president-elect, he actually tweeted out his own personal preference for who the British ambassador to the US should be. He said, yeah, I think Trump. it should be <laughs> I think it should be Nigel Farage. I think uh, he'd do a great job. Yeah. Now that was an early indicator that Trump didn't understand what the role of ambassador actually was. Yeah. Uh, it's to represent the national interests of your country, not to be a Trump superfan. <laughs> uh, um, yes. Yeah. So uh, and like a you know, his his own ambassadorial appointments in some cases were distinctly Weird, like Woody Johnson, the owner of the New York Jets, uh, <laughs> appointing him as ambassador to the New York Jets, who, by the way, have the longest playoff drought in the entirety of American professional <laughs> sports. Not exactly a conventional understanding of a winner, but there you go. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a, a little bit of historical um, uh, irony there. Yeah, I've yeah. got a good Kevin Rudd story, which is, oh, okay. is a great moment for. Yeah. Um, this is uh, from this is from back. In about 2004 ish, 2005 ish. This is, this is uh, just, this is about a, two years before he became leader, I'd say. Okay, I don't remember yep. if it was Beasley or Crean, still the leader at that point in time. But uh, Craig had, uh, the, the Labour had been in the wilderness for a long time at that mm. point in time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Kevin Rudd was on a lot of, he was doing the rounds on morning shows or whatever. And I yeah, thought yeah. he was a very, very Sunrise. polished speaker. Yes, yeah. And I thought to myself, this is this is the kind of guy Labor needs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, Sunrise basically yeah. made him Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought, yeah, he's a very effective speaker. He answers questions directly. Mm. He's like, I thought this guy's really good. And I liked his policies. He was talking about policy, policy on air all the time. I mm. thought they were really good. And um, so I was a bit of, you know, I was a bit of a rudd fan at that point in time. Yep. And so anyway, so Craig's, uh, Craig Rucastle, who's my colleague, was mm. having a, um, a some, I think it's his marriage or something, wedding or something. Yeah. And Tony Burke. Was a oh, made, yeah. of, made of Craig's. He, yes, he he turned up, yeah. right? And we were talking about um about uh, the Labor leadership as yeah. we were all teasing Tony, going, "Oh, Tony, you gonna go for it? You gonna go for it, Tony?" And um and uh, he won't mind me telling this story. Okay, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I was just thinking. And, mm. and, and, and Tony was like, uh, and I and I talked to tell Tony. I said, oh, I, I I rate Rudd. I think you should go. You guys should pick Rudd. And mm. he goes, Really? I go, Yeah, yeah. He goes, Okay, all right. Well, I've got Kevin's number. You can tell him yourself if you want. <laughs> and I go, Yeah, sure. Let's do that. And so he gave me his phone. He just yeah. he, he hits ring, and I, this is at like eleven o'clock at night. Yes. Right? And the uh, and it rings through to an answering machine, mm. and I've got this thing. When I go out, I don't drink. I don't drink at all. But I've got this thing where when I'm around drunk people, I act drunk. I'm one of those people. Like, I sort of a, like I'm a passive drunk. <laughs> and uh, um, and, uh, and I, I was in full acting drunk mode at that point wow. in time. So I pick up the phone. I'm like, Kevin, how am I? Ah, yeah, Kevin. Ah, yeah, you should go for leader, mate. Ah. Like that kind of stuff, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't very becoming. Yeah. And I don't think that Kevin Rudd would have gotten a lot out of that message. No. And then uh, and, I, and I used a few swear words as well. Mm. And now like, I, I, words I can't say here and that gives you an idea of what one of those words were. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, mm. uh, and anyway, so I hang up and yeah. literally within 30 seconds, the phone rings back. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, and Tony takes the call and he goes, Chaz, it's for you. <laughs> and he's like, hello, oh, Chaz, oh, Kevin Rudd here. You, 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 you think I should go for leadership, do you? And, uh, like, and he just wanted to have a chat. Wow. And, and, like, and I was like, my God, this guy is so thirsty. Yeah. Like, like, like in that, it's obvious that at that point in time, I was a reasonably well-known celebrity. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was thinking to himself, oh, yeah, I can leverage this. Wow. Whatever. And like, and it was. It, this is how TV-minded Rudd actually was. Yeah, and it just it just hit me all at once that I had really misjudged the guy and he absolutely should never be prime minister. <laughs> I thought, oh my god, I've made a terrible mistake, <laughs> and I never, I never promoted them ever again. Wow! And I, and at that moment on, yeah, I was probably had a better idea. There you go, Peppers, like. to celebrate yeah. episode one fifty, a rare <laughs> Planet Australia. <laughs> yes. Um, now with that. Uh, I'm sure I think what I was trying to say that your Kevin Rudd story for. Yeah, so while you're thinking, yeah, so yeah. just to reiterate, I think the biggest problem with Rudd would be that Trump loyalists just would yes. not trust him. That's what they were, that's the yeah, point yeah. I wanted to make. What people don't might not realize is yes. that Sky News has a very special relationship with conservative activists in they America. Do. Yes. Basically, no one watches, I mean, as you say, slightly more people watch Sky News and GB TV. Yes, yeah. But basically no one watches Sky News in Australia. Mm. Sky News' biggest audience by a mile 
yes. are the conservative base in America. Yes. Who like, if you look at their YouTube videos, yeah, yeah. these shows which rate 20 or 30,000 people yeah, yeah. get millions and yes. millions of YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. views because there is this base of American conservative people who like hearing their words said back to them by by yes. foreigners. Yeah. And go, oh, even in Australia they say exactly what we think. Yeah, yeah. As I, I go further than that. Sky News actually says things that Fox News won't say. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's actually Sky News is kind of a mouthpiece uh, uh, for the parts of the American right that are too extreme. When to I get say Fox News. when I yeah. say I'm not talking about Fox News here. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, yeah. about Daily Wire. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about uh, Ian Miles Chong. I'm yes. talking about yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Christopher Rufo. I'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. those guys, like the hardcore online activists. Yes, yeah, yeah. They love Sky News. They absolutely love it. And yeah, and so and those are the kinds of people who are going to be attached yes. to the next Trump administration. They, yeah, yeah, they yeah. work. Those people end up at the Heritage Foundation. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so. There's a very real chance that the people involved in the Trump administration are going to have direct ties to Sky News Australia. Yes, yeah. And so if Sky News Australia has a be in their bonnet about Kevin Rudd, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. then they can make his life a misery. They absolutely like, can. It's absolutely true. And I'll say one other thing. This is a bit less serious than that, mm. which is like old uh, whatever his name, Farage. Now, he's, 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 he's one of those uh, those – Immigrants don't share our values, kinds of guys, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uh, let me ask you: Isn't one of our values that you don't dob on people? <laughs> isn't that one of our values? It is. It dibber dobber. It was stitches. kind of pathetic. Where is stitches. Like because they've realised, you know, Trump's never going to hear of these things that Kevin Rudd has mm. said unless they tell on him. Totally. And, you know, Bully's sidekick is a role that most people in life would find fairly degrading and humiliating, but it is the role that Farage was born to play. The other thing about Farage is, as I said, his political influence in Britain has declined significantly, Mm. like from leader of the third largest party to contestant on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. One of the reasons why it's declined is because, you know, Brexit has actually happened Mm. now. Uh, and it turns out not to be uh, not to be very good, but a really good measure. This is an infallible measure of if you have an international conservative figure, how much has their influence declined in their own country is measurable by how much time they spend in Australia mm-hmm. or how much attention they give to Australia. Mm-hmm. And Farage recently has been devoting a hell of a lot of attention to. Australia. He even sees fit to complain about Pat Cummins being too woke because he doesn't <laughs> spray his Muslim teammate with alcohol. Wow, what a betrayal of Australian values that is. Now, this, as I said, you're a dobber, Farage. Yeah, you're a dobber. Five years ago, leader of the third largest party in Britain, just judged by number of votes. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, getting into that shit. So this is partly to do with Farage's own rather steeply declining relevance at this point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad we took him out. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Trump legal stuff. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, the Bragg trial being put off. Okay. First of all, I just want to give you a quick reminder of why this case is so dodgy because <laughs> because we keep on asserting it, but we never explain yeah, yeah. why. Okay. Uh, when Trump paid Michael Cohen 130000 to reimburse Cohen for paying Stormy Dan- Daniels, that was back in 2017. Yep. Trump declared it as legal services. Mm-hmm. Okay. So obviously he misdeclared it. Uh, that's it is obviously paying Cohen for hush money payments. They weren't legal services. Yep. That, by the way, is why you should never ever pay people back. Yes. Who who you owe money to? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a, a that's a lesson from Trump. That is yes. <laughs> Trump just once he broke that rule and look what happened. Look what happened. He ended up in court. Anyway, so um, this is a by the book falsification of records charge. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's a misdemeanor. Has a statute of limitation of two years. If yes. you do the maths, pull out the calculator. You'll see that takes us to 2019, yep. which is before 2024. Yes. Um, the uh, long since expired. So that's why they had to get creative. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the, the, they got creative with a felony charge. You can make it a felony mm-hmm. if you can prove that falsification was done to commit another crime. Okay. Okay. And Bragg appears to be suggesting, we're not 100% sure, that Trump was trying to commit a campaign finance crime. Yes. The reason he's doing that, just to be clear... It's not because he's trying to, it's not because he wants to send Trump to jail. It's because he has no other play. Yes. Because yes. of statute of limitations. Yep. Right. Okay. So to do that, he needs to show that it's a campaign expense. Mm. In other words, that Trump paid off Stormy Daniels because of his campaign mm. 
and not to keep the affair from his wife, mm. which is a hard thing to prove. Yes. Uh, but let's say they can. This is a federal crime. So can Bragg use a federal crime to justify a state felony charge? We don't know. No mm. one's ever tried in It history. is a completely untested theory. Okay, and especially it's an interesting theory when the federal authorities opted not to charge Trump themselves yep. for that federal crime. Yes. So you get into weird areas there. Yep. Right? And even then, the statute of limitations for that felony charge is five years. Mm. Do the maths. That's 2022, yep. not 2023 or mm. 2024. Yep. So then during COVID, New York tacked an extra year onto statute of limitations uh, provisions because courts couldn't process cases mm-hmm. for like new cases yep. for COVID. And Bragg just decided to exploit that to, yeah, yeah. to take an extra year. This is and a bit of a spiral of dodge, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. So then he indicted him in 2023. So that's yeah. how he gets around all the statute of limitations. Okay. Does that work? I don't know if the court's even going to let that let him get away with that. That's one more unknown. It does. <laughs> it reminds me of the game Mousetrap. Yeah. What? <laughs> And what I remember about playing Mousetrap as a child is a lot of the time it didn't work. Exactly. I remember a lot of equipment ending yeah. up on the floor. That's <laughs> yes. what I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so but it actually gets worse because <laughs> so they so they've been trying to so okay, so it's taken seven years to bring this case, incredibly tortured as it is. Yeah. And Bragg's predecessor opted to not bring it mm. when they could have. Yep. That would have been well within the statute of limitations then. Yep. And Bragg himself originally chose not to bring it, but then eventually changed his mind. They're mm. still having issues ha- in handing over the documents that Trump yes. needs to defend himself. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, this is why the trial's been delayed. They've been trying to get documents from the feds about Michael Cohen's trial for ages. Right, yes. And that, you can understand why that would be the case because they want to know why the feds never charged Donald Trump when they charged Michael Cohen mm. for the exact same crime. Yep. You can see how the def- that might be relevant to the defence, yep. can't you, right? You can. Um, so they asked for these documents. The feds took their time. Mm-hmm. Then they didn't seem to give them everything. So then the defence, Trump's lawyers, subpoenaed everything. And then on March 4, 21 days before the trial's due to start, they got handed 73,000 pages of documents. All right. Bragg says that apart from 172 pages of witness statements, the rest is irrelevant. That's what he says. Mm. I don't know if the defence agrees or not, but that's what he says. But even if that's true, on the 13th of March, 12 days before the trial, they got another 31,000 pages of documents, and even Bragg says that these ones are relevant. Mm. So that's concerning, right? And then the Fed said there's probably going to be more as well, Mm. and they weren't quite sure if it was going to be this week or next week, whatever, when the trial's already started. Um, This is for an indictment. It's been... Sitting on the shelves. At least the dome has been around for a year. Yep. And the case has been is seven years old. Yeah. Right. So it's it's kind of farcical, right? Yes. Yeah. That's the reason why they put the trial off to April fifteenth. Yes. Um, I think it's going to be get put up further mm. personally, but we'll see. But my question, and I said a, a num- I said a, a shorter version of this on the on Planet America on Wednesday, but what I didn't say is this. This is what I'm actually thinking. Okay. Why are the feds fucking these guys around? Because the, it's the the feds have the documents. Yeah. Why are they holding on to them? Yeah, look, I admitted to you while we were discussing what would go in today's podcast that I did not understand this. Yeah. And I don't. Like, I mean, my speculation yep. is that maybe the feds resent Alvin Bragg for charging a crime that they chose not to not to. I not can charge. believe that. That's Quite plausible. Because they're not hurting Trump here. No, they're, they're, they're giving Trump, certainly not hurting They're giving Trump a reason for delays. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. hurting Alvin Bragg. Yeah. They, they, these Democrat dudes in New York are hurting the Democrat yeah, yeah. state state uh, attorney general. So, yeah, so district attorney. So um, that, the, yeah, he's been undermined by his own supporters supposedly. Yeah. Which is really interesting. That is very interesting. I don't know where that goes, but there you go. That's the Alvin Bragg thing. Okay. Uh, Trump not paying the bond. Uh, the uh, for the fraud case. Yes. Do you have something to say about that? I do. Yeah. Um, one of the main reasons for this mm. is that apparently it's actually the law that surety companies can't accept real estate as collateral. Yeah. I did not know that. I didn't know that either. Oh, yeah, okay, go on. Yeah. And I think that one of the reasons for that 
is to do with the fact that the value of buildings once you liquidate them is pretty unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and New York real estate isn't great at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say especially unpredictable in the case of Trump's real estate. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, I, even if there wasn't a law there, if I was a surety company, I wouldn't be accepting Trump's real estate as collateral personally. Well, my question, I'm sort yes. of skipping ahead a bit here. Yeah, but yeah. My question is, yep. why can't New York accept it? Like, it, they... Like Trump is going on as if oh I've got I've got a I, like the quote mm. from Trump is yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where are we yeah I would be forced to mortgage or sell great assets perhaps at fire sale prices and if and when I win the appeal they would be gone does that make sense which hunt election interference now what he said there is correct like if if in New York yep. you need to provide you know, five hundred million dollars yes for your appeal yes yeah and. And no one has five hundred million dollars cash. No. So you need to sell your property at discounted rates, mm. and then you win the appeal. You can't just buy it back because you will have made a massive loss. So what they're essentially saying, if 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 you have to only provide cash, yeah, 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 they're saying to you, in order to have an appeal, you need to ruin yourself financially, even if you win the appeal, which is incredibly unfair. Like, that just doesn't make sense at all. Whereas, by contrast, I don't know why New York just can't accept the property. Why can't Trump just say, here are the keys to the Trump Tower. If I, if I lose the appeal, then you sell it and you give me what's left over. And if I win the appeal, then you give me the keys back. Like, why do they need cash? The whole point is supposed to be a security, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't they use property as a security? Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not saying they can't use property as a security, but in the news... No one is even considering that option. They're all mm. talking about how he's got to sell and he's saying he's got to sell. Sounds to me like bullshit. Like, I, I mean, I mean, I, maybe there's a law that New York isn't allowed to take property either, but maybe. that doesn't seem, that is, just doesn't seem to make sense to me. I've definitely seen some lawyers talking about taking property before. Mm. So I, I, it, there's something that doesn't make sense to me. Either Trump is trying to misrepresent the situation mm -hmm. or the news just doesn't understand what's going on. Or New York has been incredibly unfair. It's one of those three. Because to me, forcing him to sell property, to, to, to produce an extraordinary amount of cash so that his entire finances would be ruined, even if he wins the appeal, to me seems really unfair. I have seen stuff about the possibility that New York will seize his property. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that could refer to the kind of situation that you're talking about where they will they will hang on to it until, uh, you know, yeah. until the appeal. Um, yeah, so I've seen that. But, yeah, like you say, that, that has never really been, uh, really been explained. Um, I think in all of this there is an undercurrent that everybody recognises that these buildings are not worth anywhere near as much. Surely as, Trump Tower is worth half a billion dollars. As he claims. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, the, uh, you know, like, yes, it's true that he would probably have to sell it at a discounted rate, then obviously he'd have to buy it back at more, but I think part of that is actually an admission that um, if he sells it, then the value of that becomes real and it's nowhere near as much as uh, as is claimed. Do you agree with me, though, that, that it would be unfair if he has to if he has to do that? If he has to, like, I mean, you understand my point. You know? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I do. Like, I do understand the point. Yeah, like, and... like, let's assume that he wins the appeal. Mm -hmm. Like, if he has to sell everything for for seven hundred million dollars and to buy it back would cost two billion dollars. Mm. Yeah, you know, which is yeah, you know, that's the kind of scenario that might take place with a fire sale. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's incredibly unfair. I can see in an abstract way <laughs> sure. how that is unfair. <laughs> Shouldn't he get one of his uh, super fans to buy it off him at, at some inflated amount? Well, you know, Mark Levin yes. has been raging on Twitter about yep. wh where are all the super rich Republicans do, who are willing to give Trump some money and they'll, they'll lend him some money to, to help him out with a bond. Like, you just, like this is a, someone who everyone... On that side, acts like he's super rich and yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like treat him like a charity case. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. Like it's, uh, I mean, it, uh, yeah, a lot. 
that may be required to get him through, but it's, yeah. it's, 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 it, there's something weird about that. So there was an article in the Washington Post today about, mm. well, couldn't Trump declare bankruptcy? That would actually be one way around it because mm. if he declared bankruptcy, then there would be a years-long process of um, trying to work out exactly how much his assets are worth and who gets paid in what order. And Does that take care of the bond? It does. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That uh, that actually, um, appa- apparently, from what I was reading, that would actually take care of the, uh, or at least it would put it off. Because um, the, one of the issues at the moment is that the bond is currently increasing it's, by how much per day? It's I think it's one point two million. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's four hundred sixty seven million dollars, and I think it's one point two. Yes, million. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's part yeah. of the pro- so yeah. Um, that yeah bankruptcy. And he needs to put up one hundred twenty percent. Yes. Which is another thing which seems kind of unfair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so bankruptcy ends all of that for years. Yeah. Um, and so there's been this discussion of would he take that? The Trump's circle seems to be saying no, absolutely not. Mm. He said it looks far better for Trump to have Letitia James turn up mm. and seize his buildings mm. Uh, than it would be for him to declare bankruptcy. Now, if he did declare bankruptcy, it's not like it would be the first time. He's done it six times true. before, but obviously not in the midst of a presidential election campaign mm. where he's running as the the greatest businessman ever. So I can <laughs> see that he wouldn't do that. But this is actually something we should look into more because, yes, the situation that you've described does sound quite unfair. It, well, it's as I say, it sounds unfair in the abstract sense, although incredibly fair Applied to this particular in the person. karmic sense, yes, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I should say I haven't had a chance. As you can tell, I'm a bit behind. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look into it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it may well be that it's just like lawyers listening to this will go, yeah, duh, of course he can. Of course they can take the property. Mm. That's fine. Yeah, but yeah. just I just haven't had a chance to look into no it. No doubt so, we'll get correspondence yeah, about you this. Will. Which yeah, I will follow up on it either way. I am gonna yep. at some point I'm looking into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one more thing on this topic. The apparently the dude from Chubb, Evan Greenberg, tried to pay the bond this bond as well. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. But he just couldn't do a deal to get it together. Yeah. And there's a real question mark about what's going on with this. Yeah, bond. yeah. Because yeah, sorry, you about to say something? Um, by the way, sorry, just to just to clarify. One final thing, because yeah. you might be wondering. Okay, so you've said that this there's this thing about uh, real estate is uh, very volatile when you have to sell it under these uh, circumstances, and mm-hmm. that the reason why surety companies won't accept it as collateral is for this reason. Now you might think, yeah, but surely you know these surety companies they're not known for their like extreme standards of propriety. You think surely someone would be prepared to take the risk? The legal problem is insurance. Mm. Yeah, it's for insurance reasons that legally they can't accept real estate. Right. Yeah, they Makes would sense. actually be violating their insurance obligations. Yes. Okay, fair enough. I'll yep. take t- you well on that. But I was going to say with with Chubb, um, yep. the like a, I I I can't work out what's going on with this guy, and so right. there's a lot of speculation online. Yeah. I mean, because it, like people have pointed out that Trump appointed him to some like I think it's called the Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations. Like it, that doesn't sound like a particularly powerful position. I was going to say he might as well be one of those supervisors on the lotto. You know? <laughs> like it, it's a nothing position. You're doing nothing. Right? <laughs> so, um, but oh uh, my God. like, and and he's not like some super Republican fanboy yeah, yeah, either. Yeah. He's donated to Republicans. He's never yeah, donated yeah. to Trump though. Yes, yeah. So I don't know what like Chubb have spent two point four million dollars in the last year lobbying against security regulation. Yes, yeah. And that might be that might be it. But it's just unclear what's the, what this guy's angle is because yes. he seems to be so desperate yeah. to help Trump out yeah. <laughs> against all logic. But anyway, um, anything else on that topic, no? No, I, I thought to say one day we should just sit down and count how many references per episode we make to Australian commercial TV that a lot of our listeners just would have no <laughs> idea about because they don't watch, yeah. because they weren't watching TV in the 90s. You don't think, yeah. you don't think in America yeah, right yeah. now they have the supervisors from the lotto? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great reference point. I'm glad yeah, I Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, look, uh, as I said, I'll do Florida next week. F- Fonny Willis, I'll do it after Dave's gone because he. Did, I'm sure he has nothing to say about that. No, I don't. Um, but uh, Navarro going to jail. Do you want, do you want to talk mm. about this one? What do you want to say about Navarro? Yeah, so Navarro has gone to prison. Why don't you tell us who Navarro is? Oh, yeah, so Peter Navarro <laughs> was Trump's trade advisor. Mm. 
Um, Navarro's economic views are regarded as unorthodox within mainstream economics. So he's a he's a professor. I think he's a professor emeritus at um, University of California, Irvine. But he was certainly picked out because he was one of the few academic economists out there whose views um, align with Trump's. If I recall correctly, the reason he was picked, I'm yes. trying to remember. This is off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to know who the person was. It might have been Don Jr. Mm-hmm. It might have been someone else. Someone in Trump's orbit uh, l- searched for, I think, China. Yeah. Uh, uh, key, key words, essentially, yes. on Amazon, yeah, and they yeah. found his book. His book, and Death then, by China. Yeah, and then he was appointed off the back of that. I, okay, right. <laughs> So maybe I was attributing a little bit more uh, vigor to the search, but you know, the, uh, yeah. So his uh, his views very much uh, very much aligned with Trump's. So he is going to prison for contempt of Congress mm. because he did not respond to uh, subpoenas from Congress during the hearings into uh, into January sixth, and Congress thought that he might have had some potentially important information. Um, that he wasn't going to give to them. Now, Navarro's defence to defying that subpoena is that it was his understanding that Trump had been able to assert executive privilege which shielded certain records, including his communications with Trump at the time. Um, The Supreme Court, though, uh, has refused to actually... So, I mean, he is appealing, but he has to go to prison uh, while he appeals. Um, uh, It's it's only for four months, but still, like, you don't want to spend any amount of months in... Dude's like 150. In prison. Yeah, 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 really. And the Supreme Court uh, said, you you, you know, we're not keeping you out of prison uh, Mm. while you you wait for the appeal. That was uh, was John Roberts. Um, Given what the legal thinking seems to be about this assertion of executive privilege by Trump, that is unlikely to work, I would say, as a defence. Yeah. yeah, and if it does, he'll have served the time anyway. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> will have served the time. That's time that he can never get back. Although, my guess would be if Trump gets elected, he is getting back into that administration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And speaking of getting back into things... Where's this going? There has been speculation... <laughs> And it seems to be well founded oh, speculation. I know going. But it yeah, is, I it is okay, I stress this is speculation. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't had this directly from Trump. Speculation that Trump is bringing back Paul Manafort yes. for his campaign. Mm. Now, Paul Manafort was one of the people who actually went to jail as a result of the Russia probe. Mm. Okay. So we have to remember, even though the Mueller inquiry couldn't find conclusive evidence establishing collusion between Trump himself and Russia in the campaign. That doesn't mean it didn't find anything, okay? It found a lot. It led to indictments of 12 Russians and it did send several Americans to jail, one of whom was Paul Manafort. In particular, Paul Manafort. In particular. Yeah, like some of those other, some of those other charges, but some of them were yeah, 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 a, yeah. Little, a little not much. No, but, but Paul, Manafort Paul Manafort was actually was exactly real. what it yeah. was talking about, like yeah. actually yeah. working with Russian intelligence agencies. Working with a spy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Now, this is, <laughs> this is not just the corrupt FBI that has said this. No. There was a bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee that found that Paul Manafort uh, was working with Russian spies. Yeah, like, yeah. this is beyond a doubt. And then lying about it. And then lying about it as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And money laundering as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting because they, they, they're talking yeah, yeah. about maybe tapping him to do fundraising. Yes. The, the convicted money launderer. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, is Trump bringing him back because he is such a campaign genius? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I think that what is actually going on here is this is Trump wanting to definitively rewrite the history, right, to say that, no, the, there was nothing at all found in the Mueller investigation. Look, Paul Manafort is back because mm. he never did anything. Mm. Yes, that that is what I think is uh, is going on here. It's probably right. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's a, performs a psychological task. Mm. It does lead though to some amusing scenarios. I don't know if you've seen this clip. It's very, it's very rare that Van Jones breaks into cynicism. He's, okay, it, he's one of the very few people who still 
still in 2008. Yes, he is. <laughs> Back in the, uh, you could see him walking around the street with a Hope T-shirt. Totally. But uh, he's become he dark and cynical. Probably when, still wears it to sleep in. Yeah. When yes. you mention the name Paul Manafort, he changes. He becomes a different person. Okay. <laughs> he becomes a very. He becomes Dark Van. Okay, give and, it to uh, us. I just think Trump is not being fair to the new generation of crooks, the new generation of fraudsters, the new generation of traitors. How come he keeps going back to this old fraudster, this old traitor, this old liar? What about the young liars who are coming up who want to sell American secrets, who want to, to lie to judges? They deserve a chance. I, I, I think it's an outrage. If I were a young crook, if I were a young traitor, I would think Donald Trump is not giving me an opportunity. That was... <laughs> Not perfect. <laughs> that's, that's a very special Pep 150. That is, line. yes, yeah, yeah. These are all the gifts we are sharing you with today. <laughs> Do you have anything else to say about Van, about, not no. about Van Jones, but about Manafort? No, no uh, other than to stress this is just speculation at yeah. this point. Yeah, yeah, we haven't heard anything from Trump himself about yeah. this. We'll yeah. cover this in more depth if and when he's appointed. Yes. We'll, we'll find out. Yep. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Trump suing Stephanopoulos, George Stephanopoulos. Oh, yes. Who's yeah. the ex uh, Clinton, uh, I don't even know what he was. Was he a PR guy? What was he? He was a dog's body in the Clinton. He's in that awful movie, The War Room. Yeah. 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 But I'm not sure that's his official role. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dude who appears in movies. I think, did both him like a- and James Carvel dress in double denim in that movie? <laughs> they may well have. They may well have. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, he, he was he was some kind of sort of uh, yeah ideas guy. Yeah, yeah. In the uh, in the Clinton well, administration, I, I, it's, it's clear both he and Carvel just regard themselves as these geniuses. Yeah, and that ego is it's not helped by the fact there's this camera following their every <laughs> move around. But the great thing is, you also learn they believe in absolutely nothing. Like when they're actually asked to articulate their political beliefs, James Carville says something very vague about if Clinton gets elected, kids will have better schools. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to argue with. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait, wait. George yeah. Stephanopoulos conducted an interview uh, about two weeks ago with Nancy Bass. It was it made a bit of a splash online. Mm. This is how it began. And you've endorsed Donald Trump for president. Mm-hmm. Uh, judges and two separate juries have found him liable for rape and for defaming the victim of that rape. How do you square your endorsement of Donald Trump with the testimony we just saw? Well, I will tell you, I was raped at the age of 16. Um, and any rape victim will tell you, I've lived for 30 years with a, an incredible amount of shame over being raped. I didn't come forward because of that judgment and shame that I felt. And um, it's a shame that you will never feel, George. And I'm not going to sit here on your show and be asked a question meant to shame me about another uh, potential rape victim. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, and they went back and forth on that. Basically, mm-hmm. Stephanopoulos didn't take a step backwards. He said, yeah, "This yeah. is a fair question." And yeah, it he is. Just kept on asking it, and yep. she kept on saying, "Stop shaming me. I'm not going to be shamed." Uh, and it went for like five minutes. Mm. It was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, um, uh, it felt to me personally like Mace was trying to avoid answering yep. a legitimate question. Yes, but yeah, I haven't been raped. I don't, I'm not going to mm-hmm. mind reader. Yep. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. That 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 interview is gone. But Trump is suing Stephanopoulos for the, what I just played you, for that first question. And he's suing him for defamation for that first question. In particular, that, that, that Stephanopoulos said that he was found liable for rape. Right. I did wonder about that the moment mm. that I heard that. Yeah. Because Trump was not found liable no. for rape. He was found liable for sexual abuse. Yeah. Now, there was a subsequent ruling... Mm though, that it was not defamatory to refer to Trump as a rapist because I'll, the term rapist has I'll a get to that. broader use <laughs> yeah. than it does under New York uh, law. But, yeah, that does sound potentially defamatory Yeah, yeah. Uh, to say that he was uh, found liable for rape. Yeah, and while while I understand it sounds ridiculous on the yeah, surface yeah. to say, hey, no, I'm not a rapist, I'm just a sexual abuser. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, which is essentially their, their defence. Yes. Uh, the uh, It's... Um, I mean, yeah, and especially given that Trump's got a long history of these dubious defamation yes, lawsuits. Yeah, yeah. Like, in fact, he just paid off the New York Times like last week. Yes, three hundred ninety-two thousand dollars for yet another failed defamation suit. <laughs> the guy loves to lose, but 
I, I agree with you. That, I mean, I, uh, this is at least an interesting case. Yeah. At the very least. I imagine Stephanopoulos' defence would be that he made a mistake. Well, not not that he was doing it maliciously, well, which, of course, is the, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. bar. Well, yeah. Well, well, let's just take this a step at a time. First of all, Trump's lawyer says these statements were and remain false and were made by def- Defendant Stephanopoulos with actual malice or with a reckless disregard for the truth given that Defendant Stephanopoulos knows that these statements are patently and demonstrably false. Now, if you live in the Democrat world, Mm. you might be baffled by how Trump has any leg to stand on (laughs) because they would recall what you're referring to, Judge Kaplan, who wrote the following. Now, it wasn't in a defamation situation. It was Trump was trying to get his damages reduced or dismissed entirely because he said, I wasn't found guilty of rape. He said yes. $83 million is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I wasn't found guilty of rape, I was only found guilty of sexual abuse. And, yes, and yeah. the point Kaplan was making was that essentially the New York definition, the New York penal definition of rape is different yes. to other places. Yep. And definitely the common the, the, the common knowledge of the word rape. Yes. And so he's effectively a rapist. This yes. is what this is what Kaplan said. Uh, the finding that Miss Carroll failed to pr- prove that she was raped within the meaning of the New York penal law does not mean she failed to prove that Mr. Trump raped her, as many people commonly understand mm, the word rape. Yes, yeah. Indeed, as the evidence at trial recounted below makes clear, mm. the jury found that Mr. Trump, in fact, did exactly that. Yeah. Now, we've all heard that quote many times in Planet Democrat. Yep. So the um, so so to us, you hear that and you go, well, hang on, he's just following what the judge said. Yeah, yeah. How can he get sued for that? Um. The uh, and and just to be clear, the way the reason it's not rape under the New York Penal Code is because the New York Penal Code apparently you need to use your penis for mm. a rape, yep. and Trump allegedly used his fingers, mm. and so that is then sexual abuse, not rape. Yep. But we don't know if that's what the jury were thinking because mm-hmm. they didn't say their reasoning. Yep. But that is the speculation. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, but if you live in Republican world rather than Democrat world, you haven't heard that Kaplan quote. No. They, they never mention that. No. What you have heard instead yeah. is that the jury specifically had to fill out a form of their findings and the very form they filled out, I'll put up a screenshot right now, mm-hmm. said, did Miss Carroll prove by a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Trump raped Miss Carroll? And they ticked no. Mm. So they, the jury specifically did not find that mm. Trump raped Carol. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. Uh, and um, even though effectively they may as well have. Yes, yeah. They still, yeah, so this is what Trump's lawyer says. Yeah, yeah. The jury was expressly asked to render a determination as to whether Trump raped Carol. The verdict form is clear. The jury determined that Carol failed to prove her allegation of rape and found not liable as mm. to that allegation. Now, You've already jumped ahead a little bit where yep. you said, what's the standard? The standard is malice. Yes. Uh, which is uh, the uh, for a public figure, the sewer public figure defamation, you need malice, which means Stephen Albers can't just be wrong. Yep. You have to prove that he knows he was wrong or yes. at least he acted with reckless disregard yes, for whether yeah, he yeah. was wrong. Okay. Now, you'd think the quote from Judge Kaplan would protect him, mm. wouldn't you? But maybe not. Okay. Because in an interview with E. Jean Carroll after she won the first case six months earlier, yep. Stephanopoulos asked this question. Oh. How, about, how about yesterday in the courtroom, the first, the first uh, announcement was made and it was that he was not found liable for rape. What were we thinking at that moment? So George Stephanopoulos knows mm. for a fact that she was not found, uh, that, he was, that Trump was not found liable for rape. Mm. And he specifically said he was found liable for rape. Now, the lawyers say, the Trump lawyers say, the intensity and persistence of the questioning in the Mace interview showed that he maliciously intended to convince his viewers of a falsity. Sounds like a stretch to me. Mm. It's not legally stupid, though. Right, okay. This, yeah, this yeah. Case. Now, I think this is politically stupid mm. because I don't know why Trump would want to be arguing about whether he's technically a rapist or not for the next six months. <laughs> like he's going for the female vote. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound smart to me, but look, <coughs> look, I don't think he's going to, I don't think this, this suit will be successful. Cause no. I think, I think Stefan will argue. I forgot. Yeah. He'll say, I forgot. This was six months earlier. I asked that question. Yeah. 
I was, yeah, the, uh, and, um, and the whole thing about the, he asked the question over and over again because he's malicious. That sounds yeah, ridiculous yeah. to me. I, I, it's such a My high My suspicion bar. is that he would be nailed under Australian law. but Oh, definitely. Yeah, 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 definitely but, Australian law. But not under US law. But yeah, yeah. No, I reckon, I, I mean, we'll see. We might be wrong. All I'm saying is that it's not a stupid case. No, no. This, no. Is, a, this is a legitimate case. No, no. He actually yeah. did say something he should not have said. It's, um, so, yeah. Yes. So we, um, we'll see where that goes. Yep. Uh, I'll save the Merrick Garland bit for after the <laughs> after, after you're gone, Dave. I'm sure you have nothing to say about Merrick Garland. No. Uh, we've done Paul Manfort. Oh, yeah, just a little aside. The 14th Amendment. Yep. Supreme Court upheld the 14th Amendment. They band. did. Yeah, how about that? You said it, they, they, they said they'd never make it. Yes. <laughs> um, but not for Trump. No. Oh. <laughs> for County Commissioner in New Mexico, Coy Griffin. <laughs> Almost as big a deal, Coy yeah, Griffin. Almost. Yeah, yeah. He was convicted on misdemeanor offences for his role in the January 6th attack and he was disqualified from office under the 14th Amendment Mm -hmm. Uh, and now he's appealed to the Supreme Court and they rubber stamp the disqualification. Why? Because he's a state official, not a federal official. And remember, those are the grounds Mm -hmm. in which they struck down the Trump thing. He was a federal official and he was a state. That's right. So the state can disqualify a state official according to their tortured logic (laughs) that I still think is very, very dodgy. Anyway, there you go. There's that. Uh, election stuff. Let's do election stuff quickly. And okay. Then, and then we'll go to your Republican non-endorsements as part of that. Mm. Okay. First of all, no labels. Remember Jeff Duncan? Yep. The ex-lieutenant governor in Georgia? Oh, yeah. He said no to no oh. labels. Oh. They're really running out of options. <laughs> when the ex-lieutenant governor in Georgia says nah, you know you're really struggling. Like, uh, Coy Griffin is free. <laughs> if they want. For a federal, for a federal race. <laughs> they should get him. They're pretty much down the county commissioners, so they might. As I think well they should change their title to No Frills. Yeah, it's it's well, there's no anything. Yeah, no no candidate. No, they should no change candidate. Their, they should change their name to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't know how they can possibly. This is probably another day, but how can they possibly persist in the fiction that they got a path to victory at this point in time <laughs> when they're dealing with like the <laughs> D grade officials? Well, still say no. They have got no one anyway. Commander is going to be running for certain, okay. for no labels. They're running out of options. Now, I want to talk about the Ohio Republican primary, though. Yes. Republicans are running against Sherrod Brown, mm. who you, uh, I'm sure you're for, well familiar with, for the Peppers. Yep. He's a left wing, sort of populist type, rabble rouser, big on the working man, yep. that kind of thing. He's the kind of guy who, who when, when, when Democrats say, when Democrat pollsters say, we're not talking about economics enough, we're talking about culture yes, too yeah, much. Yeah. They're not talking about Sherry Brown when they say that. Yeah, yeah. He loves talking about minimum wages yeah. and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, he's a great politician for the area. Yes, Ohio, he is. Yeah, yeah. But he's up against it. Cook Political Report ranked the state, ranked Ohio six points more Republican than the nation as a whole. Yes, yeah. In 2022, and it's moving away. Yes, yeah. So it's yeah. going to become worse in 2024. So Brown's under the pump. Uh, the Republicans who are running to defeat him in the Republican primary for the Senate, uh, the, the two main ones, well, there was a Colombian entrepreneur, Bernie Marino, mm-hmm. who's a populist backed by Trump. Yep. And then the state senator and Cleveland Guardian's owner, Matt Dolan, mm-hmm. who's backed by ex-senator Rob Portman, Mike DeWine, essentially the establishment. Yep. Both ran for the GOP nomination for Senate in 2022. Mm-hmm. Both lost to JD Vance, yes. who Trump endorsed. Marino is uh, one of those not another dollar guys for Ukraine. Yep. Uh, Dolan is big time funding Ukraine, and yep. that seems to be the biggest split amongst Republicans mm-hmm. these days. Yep. Um, the uh, but also they're split on Trump himself. Dolan says that he backs Trump's policies, but not his temperament. Mm-hmm. Marino said, quote, I want to clear something up for everybody here. I'm so sick and tired of Republicans that will say, I support President Trump's policies, but I don't like the man. This is a good man. This is a great American. You can see why Trump supported yes. Marino. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dolan's got even bigger problems, though. Uh, Trump says Dolan's trying to be the next Mitt Romney, and <laughs> that's, that's a problem. Uh, and he also says, anybody who changes the name from the Cleveland Indians to the Cleveland Guardians should not be a senator. Wow. That's a bit of a that's a that's a groin blow that one. Oh dear. That's a shot to the head. Yeah. That's a uh, um look, he was never gonna get the MAGA endorsement no. af- after that move. No. Because you know, we're, we're talking pointless antagonism against wokeness. Yes, yep. That is the number one qualification to Absolutely, be a, a senator yes. in the Republican Party these days. Yep. Um and 
so yeah, so anyway, so he got Trump's endorsement big time. Mm. Didn't just get Trump's endorsement. He got just as importantly, he got the Democrats' endorsement. Yes, he did. They love him. Yeah. They love him because there's been four polls in March. Yes. Uh, one of them had Dolan leading Brown by two points, Marino trailing Brown by four points. Yes. One of them had the Survey USA had uh, Dolan trailing Brown by three points, Marino trailing Brown by six points. Yep. Emerson had Dolan trailing Brown by three points, Marino trailing Brown by five points. Mm-hmm. Florida Atlantic University found Dolan, why are they polling in Ohio? <laughs> found Dolan trailing Brown by four points and Moreno trailing Brown by 11 points. Yes. Wouldn't trust them. They're from Florida. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, four polls. Yeah. That showed that Mol- D- Dolan was a lot more of a threat to Brown than yep. Moreno. So the Democrats did their favorite trick, which we all know. <laughs> Which was they started running this ad. MAGA Republican Bernie Moreno is too conservative for Ohio. In Washington, Moreno would do Donald Trump's bidding. That's why Trump endorsed Moreno, calling him exactly the type of MAGA fighter that we need in the United States Senate. Moreno would lead the charge to enact Trump's MAGA agenda to repeal Obamacare and institute a national ban on abortion. Donald Trump needs Bernie Moreno. Ohio doesn't. Uh, I love it. It's the most childish <laughs> ruse and it works every it time. <laughs> Donald Trump needs Marina. How can they keep on falling for it? It's so obvious. Every time. What we're referring to for those who only just came to the podcast. Yes, is yeah. The Democrats love doing this where they run an ad. Yes, yeah. Where, which for, which ostensibly is is a negative ad, but really is the most positive possible ad for the other side. Yes. To try and get the other side to support the guy they want to defeat. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and they don't get the slightest bit creative about this. The wording <laughs> they always use is too conservative for, yes. no matter what state they're in, <laughs> yeah. no matter how conservative it actually is. Yeah. Yes. A, a lot of these ads are really cookie cutter. They're all, they yeah, are all yeah, yeah. basically the same ad. Yes. It's, it's, you're right. It's just so insulting. Yeah. Now, a couple yeah. of weeks ago, mm. we talked about the last person to use this who was- uh, in California. In California. Yeah. Uh, Adam Shifty Shift. Adam Shifty Shift. <laughs> yeah. And I've got to share with you episode- <laughs> 150. An absolutely shocking <laughs> revelation. And I really hope that Trump is listening to this episode. We know mm. we know he's a pepper because uh we have discovered that uh the identity of one of America's most notorious masked villains is none other than Shifty Shift. Please, detail. Shifty though. Shift is the Hamburglar! The hell? Of course he is! The absolute worst supervillain of all! Because <laughs> he steals McDonald's! Okay, I don't even know if I can put them side by side, but I'm going to try. And yeah. if I can't, I'll just flick back and forth so you can all see the similarity. Now, could anything be more <laughs> offensive to Trump? Then not only is Shifty Shift going after him in Congress, he's then going and stealing his burgers! From Air Force One or whatever the equivalent of Air Force One is now. So typical of Shifty Shift. So typical. (laughs) Yeah. Love the way you worked that in, Dave. That's right. Because Dave's been trying to work this in for ages. And I I did have a Shift reference in the Robert Hur section coming up. And I knew that Dave did not want us to do the Robert Hur section. (laughs) And I was thinking to myself, but he's going to want to do this just for the Adam Shift reference. That's right. But he cleverly worked it in (laughs) before the Robert Hur section. For those who don't, seriously, look, it's the cheekbones and the mouth. Yeah. That's what gives it away. Yeah, and I think because the, like the, all eyes go- are, the eyes are also... Yeah, because like go- all good masked villains, he wears the <laughs> smallest, shittiest mask possible. The thing about Adam Schiff, though, is yeah. he doesn't just look like the Hamburglar. He yeah. also looks a little bit like Mayor McCheese. <laughs> he looks like all the McDonald's characters. <laughs> That's the problem. It's because he doesn't have, he doesn't have eye, well, uh, eyelids. May- That's why. Maybe he's got multiple roles in McDonald's <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say they don't actually have that many citizens there. <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah, yeah. People have to perform multiple roles. And they're all related to Adam Schiff. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, so well done on that, Dave. <laughs> um, but uh, um, anyway, but yes, yeah, so, okay, so so the Democrats did their did their shenanigans. Yes. Right? They spent $3 million on that ad. Yep. Right? And, um, <laughs> <laughs> Worth every cent. And it was working. Everyone was happy. Trump was happy and the yeah. Democrats were happy. Everyone's happy. Except for a late-breaking scandal. Mm. Last week. Yep. 
We, we discovered in 2008, someone used Marino's email address yeah. to make an account on Adult Friend Finder, <laughs> which I've never heard of, but I knew exactly what it was as soon as I heard the name. <clears throat> Seeking men for one-on-one sex. That's a wow. quote. The bio reads, quote, hi, looking for young guys to have fun with while traveling. Mm. There's no profile picture, but it goes by the name Nardo1967-2. Wow. Nardo. Probably short for Bernardo, which is his name. Yeah. Born in 967 February. Wow. So, so <laughs> the pieces are falling into place. Uh, it's not exactly a Da Vinci code so far. Uh, <laughs> it also uses Marino's email address, this profile. And we know that because mm. AFF records were leaked during the data breach a few years back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, there's apparently geolocation data that shows the account was set up near where Marino's parents owned a home in Fort La- Lauderdale. Right. Now, that's on one hand. On the mm. other hand, it was only accessed for six hours after the account was formed. You might say, that's enough time. <laughs> that is exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He only wants one. Adult he friend finder was not renowned for, you know, establishing long-term marriages. No, no yeah. he's only looking for one for one-on-one. Yes, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, but there's also an explanation for the six-hour thing, which mm-hmm. is Moreno ex-staffer Dan Ritchie has provided a sworn statement in which mm. he says that he started the account yep. as a prank and then he changed ah, his mind. Right. And that was why it was only for six, six hours. As for the geolocation data, the Moreno campaign claims it was manually entered at the time because it was 2008. <laughs> so it's not really proof of anything. Right? Mm. The, uh, that's what they say. Now, I don't know what's true and what's not. Yeah. But you might ask, why does this matter? Yeah. Are we all homophobes now? Well, maybe the Republicans in Ohio, Ohio yes, are, yeah. but I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, but LGBTQ issues loom large for Marino yes. generally because yep. his oldest son is gay. He used to be very pro-gay. Mm. He used to be uh, support LGBTQ rights and he used to support any discrimination legislation as recently as 2020. Yeah. And then something changed, mm. which was he ran for the Senate yeah. in, in Ohio. <laughs> And in 2021, he changed his mind entirely. Mm. And now he loves talking about the radical agenda of LGBTQ activists yep. and their indoctrination. He even ran ads against another candidate, accusing them of being pro-trans. Wow. So that's his new persona. Uh, it's already, there's probably a bit of tension there already. Yeah. You add massive hypocrite on top of it. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's not going to help him, right? Having said that, he still won by 20 points. Yes. Because of the, the combined efforts of the Democrats and, the, and Trump. <laughs> and, uh, so let's see if the Republicans can throw away another Senate seat mm. by nominating a Trump <laughs> pick. This could be a really important seat. Could be. Like, as, like, as, like, even if the Republicans take the House, we keep on sa- take the Senate. We keep on saying this. There's a big difference between 51, yep. 52, yep. and 53. Absolutely. So, yeah, so this is going to be critical. Yeah, it, yeah. And I, Jared Brown will be hard to dislodge. He will be. He's very popular. He He's be. been there for a long time. And one thing you can be sure of is unlike normally with Sherrod Brown, he's yeah. going to be carrying $100 million with him this yes, time. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the Democrats are going to be all over this one. Yes. So, yeah, this is going to be probably the biggest Senate race, I reckon. Yep. Or maybe maybe Florida, depending on how that goes. We'll mm, say. Yes, yeah. Anyway, uh, by contrast, by the way, yeah. there's a little toilet break. Yes. The uh, and It's not a toilet break for you because you're going to go soon, but, yep. but for the peppers. Yes. <laughs> This is how the Democrats are picking candidates. Instead of picking Mr. Adult Friend Finder and, and all that kind of stuff, they're picking people like this is in California mm. that we're talking about here, a very left-wing place. Yeah, yeah. But this was, uh, shall we say, a different vibe for mm. a candidate. My grandparents were Republicans. They met in the military during World War II, served their country proudly, then opened a business selling parts for U.S. fighter jets. Their political heroes were Dwight Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan. And they taught me that the GOP stood for smaller government, personal responsibility, law and order, and standing up to Russia. The reason I'm a Democrat today is that the party my grandparents once believed in no longer stands for any of those things. Just extremism and the politics of division, which have kept Ken Calvert in office for 32 years. My career has been about public service, First, working for a Republican governor, then in counterterrorism at the Department of Justice and a prosecutor protecting Riverside County. I'm a lot of what the Republican Party used to be, but isn't anymore. I care about your freedom and your security, just like you. Send me to DC and I'll fight for those things every day. I think my grandparents would have liked that. I'm Will Rollins and I approve this message. 
my personal view is going for the median voter makes sense. Yes. Going for the soft the soft uh, supporters of the other side makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah. But hey, you do you, Ohio Republicans. Let's see how that works <laughs> out. <laughs> um, okay, Dave, uh, Republican non-endorsements. Yes. Yeah. So there have been a couple of significant conservative non-endorsements. Yeah. Most prominent of these is, of course, Mike Pence. Yes. Yes, uh, Trump's former vice president. Let's play it. Will you be endorsing your former president? Uh, you were on the ticket with him last time around. Well, Martha, I appreciate the question. And it should come as no surprise that I will not be endorsing Donald Trump this year. Look, I, I'm incredibly proud of the record of our administration. It was a conservative record that made America more prosperous, more secure, uh, and, and saw conservatives appointed to our course in a more peaceful world. Uh, but uh, th that being said, during my presidential campaign, I made it clear that there were profound differences uh, between me and, and President Trump on a range of issues. Uh, and, and not just uh, our difference on my constitutional duties that I exercised on January the 6th. I mean, as, as I have watched his candidacy unfold, I've seen him walking away uh, from uh, our commitment to uh, confronting the national debt. I've seen him uh, starting to, to shy away from a, a commitment to the sanctity of human life. And this last week is his reversal uh, on, on getting tough on China uh, and, and supporting our administration's effort uh, to force uh, a sale uh, of, uh, of uh, ByteDance TikTok Why do you think uh, he did that? Why do you think he had that reversal on that before we go, sir? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't speculate on it. But what I can tell you is, is that in each of these cases, uh, Donald Trump is pursuing and articulating an agenda that is at odds with the conservative agenda that, that we governed on during our four years. And that's why I cannot in good conscience uh, endorse Donald Trump in this campaign. And I think he's the only major candidate from this cycle who has actually not endorsed Trump. Yeah. Like, like when, when I mentioned this to John the other day, he yeah. was like, oh, of course he didn't because, you know, Trump wanted to hang him. Yeah. But I was like, hang on. There were people who hate Trump a lot more than Mike Pence yes. who yeah, are yeah, still yeah, yeah. supporting Trump. Yeah. He's literally the only one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So that's one Indiana conservative. Another is Senator Todd Young. Yeah. Uh, Senator Todd Young said he won't vote for Biden, but he won't vote for Trump. Mm. And um, Todd Young is interesting because he got re-elected in 2022, so he is next up for re-election in 2028. Yeah. Now, he is, like, he's not that old by Senate standards. He was born in 1972, so he would be in his early 50s. Mm. Um, so I don't know if he's planning for this to be his last term, but he might also be reasoning that by 2028, this is no longer going to be a liability for him. Um, he wouldn't be the only Republican who's actually betting on basically a bad second Trump presidency. I, I should say his issue, yeah. the reason for him, yeah, he's yeah. given an issue, which is Ukraine. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. And like I think Pence has hinted pretty heavily at that yeah. as well. Well, in, in the clip that I just played, I didn't play yeah, the whole yeah. clip for Dave, uh, he, he cited um, January 6th, yeah. the debt, Yes. Abortion and TikTok. And TikTok, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. four reasons. Yes. <laughs> now, speaking of that, um, there's a Washington Post columnist, Mark Thyssen, mm. um, who has also this week said, under the current circumstances, he can't endorse Trump. And you might be thinking, well, this guy's not an office holder. He's just an incredibly annoying uh, <laughs> columnist. Why does this matter? Uh, what matters is he's listing the same kinds of reasons as mm. uh, as these two Indiana politicians. Um yeah, uh, basically Russia and TikTok. Mm. Um, and it did, I didn't think that Trump's non-endorsement of the TikTok divestiture was going to come back to bite him in any mm. way. And, look, you could argue it hasn't at all. These are just non-endorsements from people who don't actually matter anymore. Um, what this does suggest, though, is there is this little core out there of people who you might have actually expected to uh, to capitulate who are not capitulating. Speaking of which... In the Florida primary that has just happened, 19% of people didn't actually vote for Trump uh, in that primary. Uncommitted? Uh, no, not uncommitted. This was people who voted for DeSantis or Haley. Not for Ryan Binkley? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many votes Binkley got. But um, 
uh, it was, mm. I think early voting was about halfway through by the mm. time Haley dropped out. Obviously, DeSantis yeah. dropped out um, long ago. But there's yeah. actually, uh, the thing about Florida is primaries, that's closed to the, uh, anyone except actually registered right. Republicans. Yeah. So that is actually still a pretty significant protest vote that is going on. Yeah. That is still in just about every race, I think with the exception of Minnesota, uh, Trump is getting a higher protest vote against him than Biden is actually getting on the Democratic side. And also, to be to be fair, um, yeah, yeah. The, like we're saying, oh, no one cares what these people think, and maybe they no. don't, but... At the very least, Fox News. What, yeah, yeah. What, what's a usually a good sign of yeah, something yeah. that might be harmful to the Republicans? Yes, yeah. Is when Fox News doesn't talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And he announced it. He announced that he wasn't going to support Trump on Fox News. Yes, yeah, yeah. And yet, over the next four days yeah, after yeah. that, that that story was covered on on CNN yeah, for yeah. an hour nineteen. On MSNBC for an hour 14 yeah. and on Fox News for four minutes. Yeah, yeah. They basically didn't never mention it again. Yeah, yeah. Which is a sign that they wanted to keep that quiet. Yeah. So draw your own conclusions. Yeah, and look, it's not nowhere. Like 155,000 people turned up in Florida to vote for Nikki Haley. Mm. Like that's that's not nothing. No. Um, that does indicate a level of pissed offness out there that could potentially cost Trump a bit. Yeah. So, it, it, is it, so the... The uh, the county, I know laundromat cleaner who's re- representing uh, no labels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's got some real opportunities there in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, by just a little side, I mentioned this on on Play America, but I, yeah. I want everyone to know this because this is amazing. This mm. is an observation from Mar- Marcy Wheeler. I'm not going to yeah. take credit for this. Okay, yeah. It was March 15 that Mike Pence made that announcement. The Ides of ah. March. The Ides of March. Incredible. Hit two, Mike. Yes, mm. incredible. Anyway, uh, you got anything else to say about, anything about that topic? No? Nope. Nope. Okay, we'll skip past Robert Hur. You've, okay. you, you've earned the right for the, to not have to listen to me talk about Robert yep. Hur. I'll do that after you're gone. And uh, Biden Netanyahu, who was the next one I had here? You yes. Want, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think we should actually start with uh, Chuck Schumer's comments. Yep. So Chuck I, Schumer. I got a clip. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, It has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Nobody expects Prime Minister Netanyahu to do the things that must be done to break the cycle of violence to preserve Israel's credibility on the world stage and to work towards a two-state solution. He won't commit to a military operation in Rafah that prioritizes protecting civilian life. He won't engage responsibly in discussions about a day-after plan for Gaza and a long-term and a longer-term pathway to peace. Hamas and the Palestinians who support and tolerate their evil ways Radical right-wing Israelis in government and society, President Abbas, Prime Minister Netanyahu. These are the four obstacles to peace. And if we fail to overcome them, then Israel and the West Bank and Gaza will be trapped in the same violent state of affairs they've experienced for the last 75 years. So Chuck Schumer, who is the highest ranking Jewish official, not just now, but in United States history, is saying that there should be elections to get rid of Netanyahu. That's a pretty significant um, statement. That was met by accusations from Mitch McConnell that Democrats have an anti-Israel problem, not Mm -hmm. an anti-Netanyahu problem. That obviously is an accusation that that loses quite a bit of credibility when you consider who Chuck Schumer is. Not just who Chuck Schumer is, but in fact how supportive of Israel he has actually been up until this point. Mm. Um. So one of the things that I think is going on here is, as we were talking about earlier, uh, the Democratic leadership has got a very difficult job to do of trying to appease multiple constituencies for this. I think that from the beginning, they should have gone after Netanyahu. Mm. They should have said, as has been widely recognised, 
that this attack was actually partly a product of the way that Netanyahu approached this whole problem, which was to see Hamas as a useful counterweight to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, uh, yeah, not to see it as a uh, not to see it as a threat. Yeah. And um, you know, also selling this pipe dream of the Abraham Accords that you could make peace with the Arab world while completely ignoring the mm. Palestinian issue. Um, uh, it was Hamas who carried out that attack, but they did it under conditions that were made possible by Netanyahu. Netanyahu is quite unpopular in Israel at the moment. According to the Israel Democracy Institute, only 15% of the population wants Netanyahu to stay on as Prime Minister once the war concludes. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, there. I mean, yeah, he is very unpopular in Israel now. And what that tells you is Netanyahu will try to prolong the war for as long as possible. Mm. Uh, that is one of the particularly bleak things about this mm. is that Netanyahu has every incentive to just keep it going for as long as possible because mm. that's what not only is what's going to keep him in office, remember, that's what's going to keep him out of jail. Yeah. So a lot of people are going to die so that Netanyahu can stay out of jail. Um, for Biden and Schumer... I would have thought this is the way if you, you know. Hang on. Yep. You just brought in Biden. We haven't mentioned him. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is what Biden had to say about Schumer. Senator Schumer uh, contacted my staff, my senior staff. He's going to make that speech. And uh, he, uh, I'm not going to elaborate on a speech. He made a good speech. And I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him but by many Americans. Okay, so very careful. Yeah, yeah. But. Surprisingly supportive, yeah, I think, yeah, for, for Biden, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. And look, if they are looking for a way that Biden seems to have been desperately searching for to be pro Israel while criticizing Israeli conduct in the war, mm. go after Netanyahu. Mm. That's what they should have been doing from the beginning. Mm. Go after Netanyahu. I think that they're beginning to realize this now. So, yes, that was surprisingly supportive from Biden. Um, at the same time, there is this, you know, that when we, okay, all rhetoric aside, back to the real world, uh, is that Biden just does not seem prepared to use American military support for Israel as leverage to get Israel to do anything differently. Mm. In fact, there's a fantastic quote uh, from the Washington Post today about this, Um it says, US officials have said privately that they have considered restricting arms shipments, but concerns about losing influence with the Netanyahu government have carried the day, have so far carried the day, even as the administration has become more outspoken in its disagreement with what it calls Israel's lack of a coherent, sustainable strategy in the war. Concerns about losing influence with the Netanyahu government. It is clear they have no influence over mm. the Netanyahu government. Netanyahu is openly contemptuous of the administration that is supplying a lot of their weapons because he knows they are not going to use that as leverage so he can tell them to fuck off mm. anytime they make a suggestion like don't invade Rafa, uh, let civilian aid through, just a real sort of bare minimum basic conduct of war stuff that Netanyahu is not doing because he knows that the military aid is going to keep flowing. Mm. Um, so what influence? What influence are they possibly going to lose with the Netanyahu government? They don't have any. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so I can see why Schumer is calling for new elections. Yeah, there was a period towards the end of last year. I don't yeah. have it. It's off the top of my head, so I don't have the exact details. Yeah. When Biden wasn't talking to Netanyahu, Mm. And like, and there was, a, and 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 Blinken went to Israel, mm. and basically, I think the phrase was, he said something like, "You don't have the credit to keep to keep going like this." Yes, yeah. And that got immediately leaked. Yes. To uh, to the Israeli press. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like, so they were undermining, they were white anting Blinken. Yeah, yeah. And Biden wasn't even talking to Netanyahu. Yes, yeah. So that was pretty frosty that period there. Yes, yeah. And even at during that period, yeah. Biden was trying. To pass legislation, yep. to uh, make to to create a situation where Israel could automatically get weapons without it going through Congress. Yes, yeah. Because right now it has to go through Congress. Yeah, yeah. And, and then he's going, he was actually trying to make it easier. Yes, yeah. For Israel to get weapons. Yeah, yeah. At yeah. that exact time, 
when they were at rock bottom. Yes, yeah, and yeah. That really said a lot. Yes. Of so of course mm. Netanyahu isn't listening to any of his suggestions about how mm. the war should be conducted because the weapons are going to keep coming. Um, uh, yeah. So let, let me let me put a question to you. Yes, first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is. This is what Netanyahu had to say about all this yes. because he, he wasn't enjoying Chuck Schumer's speech, no. unsurprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this was what this was his response was, and, mm-hmm. then I, and then I'll give you a fact after this, yeah. a few facts, and then ask you a question. Mm-hmm. And as far as uh, what Senator Schumer said, the majority of Israelis support our governments. 82% of Americans support Israel instead of Hamas, but the majority of Israelis support the policies that we're leading. Uh, go into Rafah destroy the remaining uh, Hamas terrorist battalions, make sure that we don't put into Gaza instead of Hamas, the Palestinian Authority that educates okay. their children towards terrorism and the annihilation of Israel, uh, and and also uh, an enormous uh, majority here, including 99 uh- Knesset members to nine, uh, oppose the idea of ramming down a Palestinian state down our throats. I want to so, get to you know, some of those polls. The majority of Israelis, I, this is a wake a up call to uh, Senator Schumer. The majority of Israelis support the policies of my government. Oh. It's not a fringe government, it represents the policies supported by the majority of the people. If Senator Schumer opposes these policies, he's not opposing me, he's opposing the people of Israel. As we said, 15% of Israel supports Netanyahu, but what he said? Is right. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only thirty-seven percent support a negotiated end to the war, even on favourable terms. Yes, yeah. In Israel, yeah. Sixty-eight percent oppose the transfer of humanitarian aid to Gaza, mm. even if UNRWA isn't involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eighty-three percent say this is the same poll, by the way. This yes. is the same poll yeah, that yeah, had yeah. the fifteen percent for Netanyahu. Yeah. Eighty-three percent say there's little chance of ever reforming the Palestinian Authority. Seventy-two mm-hmm. percent think the establishment of a demilitarized Palestinian state would either increase terrorism against Israel or have no effect at all. Yes, like Netanyahu is correct. They might hate him. Yeah, yeah. But they like the war. Yeah, yeah. And they don't like the two-state solution. Right. Yes. So what happens? And that's that goes back to what we said earlier. For as long as the war continues, mm. he's fine. Mm. So his stuff about we'll go in and destroy Rafa and destroy Hamas, mm. I'm guessing it's never going to happen. Mm. I mean, well, I mean, he might destroy Rafa, but I'm guessing there's not going to be a point where Israel says, "Oh, Hamas is now destroyed." Sure. But uh, yeah, but but my point is that yeah. if somehow they had an election tomorrow and Netanyahu disappeared, yeah, yeah, Benny Gantz would have the same policy. Yeah, oh, yeah, he would because that's what Israel wants. He would absolutely. So so what, what? Where do we go from there? Well, <laughs> the, you, the US has got to decide what its own values are mm. in this situation given that they're the ones who are supplying a lot of the weapons. Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, they, they have to decide what their own values are. Mm. Um, that population that, that Netanyahu was talking about is not voting in the US. Mm. Um, Americans have pretty different views uh, mm. on that. They've mm. got, I mean, a lot of them are very pro-Israel. Mm. Um, but a lot of them are very opposed to at least the Israeli conduct mm. um, in the war. Now, on the other side, Netanyahu recently uh, he addressed Republicans behind closed doors. He asked to address Democratic senators as well, and Schumer uh, unsurprisingly said no mm. to that. Uh, we also have, over the last week, Trump is up to his classic rhetoric of Jews who vote Democratic hate Israel <laughs> and hate their religion. He loves that. Yes, <laughs> uh, according to that. That's yeah. Jews who vote Democratic. So Jews who uh, lead the Democratic Party in the Senate. I can't imagine what he's got to say <laughs> um, about them. Now, um, there's obviously been a lot of talk about anti-Semitism over the last few months. That is anti-Semitism. Mm. That is, a, you know... Uh, for a non-Jew to set himself up as the, uh, yeah. you know, as the true judge of who the true Jews are, someone <laughs> who has to agree with his views on Israel, Palestine, and with Netanyahu's, this is part of a long line of things that he said, like speaking to American Jews and referring to Netanyahu as your prime minister, <laughs> as saying, yeah, yeah, saying when he, whenever he says that American. Jews who vote Democratic are disloyal to Israel. He's basically implying that's their country Mm. and this is the issue that they should be voting on despite the fact that they're Americans. Everything that Trump says essentially suggests that Jews are a people apart from the United States and that, uh, you know, what they really are is some kind of bridgehead to Israel. Mm. Um, That in itself is anti-Semitism. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, By the way, on the... 
interfering, like you mentioned Mitch McConnell. Yes. His critique of Schumer was always, you know, like he shouldn't be interfering in another country's elections. Look, broadly that's true, but given how many different elections the, the United States issues proclamations about, yeah. how many countries they say this needs a change of government. Yeah. I mean, it's not, this is, the fact that they're doing it, they're saying it about an ally as opposed to an opponent. Yeah. Like, it, you know, I, I but, see the point. But but, but also, also, yeah. I think Jake Sullivan made a fair point as well, yeah, which yeah. was that Israel interferes with America a lot more than America interferes with <laughs> Israel. True. Like yes. the point he made was you have the Prime Minister speaking on American television, I just played that, Yes. about his concerns about Americans interfering in Israeli politics. Yeah, and then yeah. your question is, should Americans be speaking into uh, in Israeli politics, which in yeah. fact we don't do nearly as much as they speak into ours? I mean, he's right. Like, yeah. like when does Biden turn up on Israeli TV? Yes, yeah, yeah uh, pitching his case. Mm. He just doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's. I mean, Netanyahu famously campaigned against Obama. Yes, but leaving that aside, even now he's still he's been on t- American TV a lot yes, over the last few months. Yes, yeah. So yeah. yeah, and it's and he's always political. Mm. So it's uh, yeah, it's a. Bit cheeky, yes. <laughs> it's a bit cheeky for him him to be complaining. Yep. Um, uh, I'd say one other thing on this topic, which is that look, yeah, Biden is because he's been pulled in two directions. He's moving glacially slowly yes. in, in any direction because yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah. want to offend one side by yeah. moving too quickly in the, in the other direction. Yes. But I think that the 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 moves that he is making, as long as they're taking. Mm. And as conservatives they are, I think they're they're directionally good. Yes. Like in that, I, I like the fact he's focusing on aid. Mm. I mean, like I know a lot of the peppers listening to this will go, "Hey, how about you stop the bombs?" Yes. But like the, I understand why it's pretty hard for him to stop the bombs. Mm. At the very least, the aid is a good place to start. Yeah. And I like that he's focusing on that and the pon- and the pontoon or tier or the pier or whatever they call it. Yes. I think that's a good suggestion. Mm. Um. I think him sanctioning directly settlers who are violent. Mm. I think that's good. Yeah, and I, they should have done that ten years ago. Mm. Yes, and they uh, and I think that the and I, I look forward to him slowly ramping that up further and further and further because I think yeah that is one of the I, I keep on saying this whenever we bring up Israel. I think the settlers are the biggest problem, mm. and like even though they're not in the news and they 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 they're kind of. Uh, Behind the scenes, yeah, I think they are just a constant irritant to yes. any situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there's that as well, and um, uh, also the another thing which doesn't get hasn't been in the news at all is mm. that Netanyahu has been part of the arrangement with um, with Gaza and the West Bank yeah. is that Israel collects taxes for them. Yes, because they can't collect their own taxes because they're not an official country. They mm. have taxation powers. And then they give them money mm. from the taxes. Netanyahu hasn't been giving them money. Yeah. I understand why he hasn't been giving Gaza money. Mm. <laughs> In the last five months, I get that. Yes. Who is he going to give it to? Yeah, they're, yeah. they're underground. Yeah. But he can give the West Bank money mm. and he hasn't been. Yeah. And that's something else that Biden's been pushing. Yes. Behind the scenes. Mm. We, we don't hear so much about that. It's yeah, yeah. Not, not a sexy topic. No. But I'd like to see him push harder on that one as yeah. well. Do you have anything else to say about this general topic? Nope. So I think that is it from me. (laughs) Yeah. We are. Yeah. That is it from Dave. So happy 150th, everybody. Thank you, Dave. And happy uh, 150 to you as well. We will see you next week for the pre Easter episode. Next Thursday, Dave. See you then. All right. See you then. And I will continue for the next uh, 50 minutes or so with the Chaz Unleashed. Okay, what have I missed? I skipped past all kinds of stuff before. Okay, first thing was I had an update on the Judicial Council. You might recall what I was grateful for last week. I was grateful for the end. Well, I did put a flag on this one. What we hoped was the end of judicial shopping in America. And I said at the time, I don't even know if they can do this. But I said, I'm glad they're trying at the very least. Well, they can't do it. Um, (laughs) Sorry, Dave. Um, yeah, the, uh, they released the actual guidance this week and they didn't even try to make it compulsory. This is what the guidance says. This is how it starts. So that it starts with district courts should apply district wide assignment. The word should is really important there. It means that they don't have to, 
Mitch McConnell wrote a letter backing over that, saying, to state the obvious, judicial conference policy is not legislation. It's Congress that decides how cases should be assigned in the inferior courts, and Congress has already spoken on this issue in an enacted statute. Congress gave that power to the individual district courts. Whatever the judicial conference thinks you ought to do, what you actually choose to do is left to your court's discretion under the law. Now, there are, there are practical concerns as well. It's not just a partisan hack concerns. Um, Chief Judge Alia Moses of the Western District of Texas said it was hard to imagine how a random case assignment policy, because, oh yeah, I should just recap for those who don't remember what I was talking about. Until now, there's been a situation where you have, uh, d- you have districts, um, which are large areas with lots of courts, and then you have small areas called divisions. Normally, when you assign a case, you assign it to a district and a random judge is chosen. But in some areas, they assign them to divisions where there's only one judge. So you can choose the judge that you assign a case to. So if you're a conservative, say, trying to find a super conservative judge, you know you should go to Amarillo, where the most conservative judge in America is. And that's a way of rigging a case, essentially. So you get a conservative outcome. Uh, Democrats, I should say, don't need to do that because there are, in the Ninth Circuit, whole districts which are only 100% Democrat judges. So it's easier for Democrats to, to rig it if they want. But uh, that, that's that's a problem for another day. Uh, but uh, and that, that, that's a point Mitch McConnell's been making. But anyway, Aaliyah Moses made the point that in her, that in her district, the next courthouse is several days' drive away. And she said, if you make them go to a different part of the district, it could be yeah, it could be five or six days drive. Like this could be this could be a real problem. And uh, and so she said the move was understandable, but difficult to apply in the real world in a district in a district that has ninety three thousand square miles in size. Now Jeffrey Sutton, who was the guy who who um, was responsible for the guidance, he suggested some proceedings could be held online. Sounds like good advice to me. But the bottom line is that the but he can't make them do that. The people who are most concerned about judicial shopping are the partisans who most benefit from it. They're really into it. And uh, it's hard to see them voluntarily giving up the power to do it. And no one can make them except for Congress. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so there's that topic. Then the next one, which I skipped past, was Fonnie Willis. Okay, so now... Judge McAfee said that there is no conflict. Uh, he he said that paying Nathan Wade $728,000, that was her underling. She was a district attorney in Georgia. We're talking about the Trump case, the the Trump-Georgia uh, case, uh, the, the racketeering case they're charging him for, January 6th uh, involved. Um, Forney Willis hired this guy, Nathan Wade. She paid him $728,000 in legal fees. She was going out with him at the time. She's accused of going out with him before she appointed him. She said they started going out after she that she start, she first appointed him. Either way, she was going out with him while he was appointed. And the accusation was there was a conflict because she was financially benefiting because he was paying for her trips and her meals and so forth. So she was financially benefiting from, from the appointment she made. And she also had incentive to extend the trial, which is, is a disadvantage to Trump. Now, the judge said there's no real financial benefit to her, so there's no conflict. He said that while there may have been a net financial benefit from hiring Wade, it was very small. He said he's worked out about twelve to twelve thousand to fifteen thousand dollars max in Willis's favor. This is someone who own who, who earns over two hundred grand a year, right? He also noted that they couldn't contradict Willis's testimony, where she said she paid him back in cash. And he said, you can't prove she didn't. Uh, and he also said it was corroborated to a certain extent, not completely, but to a certain extent it was corroborated that she does spend a lot of money in cash and doesn't keep receipts. Uh, he said it was not inherently unbelievable. So he accepted that there was no proven significant financial benefit to Willis. He also said, as for trying to delay the case, he said that, she, that the idea that she delayed the case to receive more financial benefit was unlikely. She repeated. She repeatedly tried to bring the case to trial quickly, he said, suggesting no improper motive to delay. And of course, she was trying to speed up the trial. She wanted to get it done before the election. We all know that. 
So that makes sense. Mind you, he really gave her a clip on the way through. He said, Judge McAfee said, this finding is by no means an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse in judgment or the unprofessional manner of the district attorney's testimony during the evidentiary hearing. He called her testimony unprofessional. By the way, I agree with him. I thought she was really bad on the stand. But that is quite an insult for the person who is now going to be prosecuting Trump in front of him, in front of the judge, that is. The person he just called unprofessional. Uh, but he did say that while there was, while he gave her a clip, he said there's no, still no conflict, although there might be the appearance of conflict. And this is where it gets a bit strange. Even after explaining why any financial benefit was pretty pissy and unproven, he then continued on as if it was still a concern. He said, quote, the court finds that defendants failed to meet their burden of proving that the district attorney acquired an actual conflict of interest in this case through her personal relationship and recurring travels with her lead prosecutor. However, the established record now highlights a significant appearance of impropriety that infects the current structure of the prosecution team, an appearance that must be removed through the state selection of one of two options. Those two options were either Willis and her whole office needs to step down or Wade needs to step down. So Wade stepped down. Now, my question is, how does that work? Why do you need to fire someone to deal with the appearance of impropriety when there's no proven impropriety? This is what he said. He said, even if the romantic relationship began after Wade's initial contract in November 2021, the district attorney chose to continue supervising and paying Wade while maintaining such a relationship. She further allowed the regular and loose exchange of money between them without any exact or verifiable measure of reconciliation. This lack of a confirmed financial split creates the possibility and appearance that the district attorney benefited, albeit non-materially from a contract whose award lay solely within her purview and policing. For a start, non-materially. So he's saying it's not even to do with finance. Like, it doesn't make sense. But also, he's saying it doesn't matter if you can't prove it. The fact that there's claims is enough. That's enough to punish the DA, which seems incredibly unfair to me. You're supposed to have to prove things or at least at least, at least proven by some standard. Like, he really trashed the evidence and then he just turns around and says, well, people are making claims, so they should be punished anyway. But okay, let's say it's not about punishment, it's about keeping up appearances. You don't want the appearance of impropriety for the DA. That makes sense. So let's say that's the case. It's super important for prosecutors to be above any suspicion. Well, why don't you need, them, why don't you need both of them to step down then? Because Willis appears dodgy as well. Why is it okay for her to continue? Why is her appearance of impropriety not important? But it's just important that both their appearance of impropriety doesn't exist. That, that it, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get why two dodgy people is a problem, but one dodgy, pe- dodgy person is fine. That makes no sense to me at all. It gets worse. He then said, an odour of mendacity remains. Reasonable questions about whether the district attorney and her hand-selected lead testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship further underpin the finding of an appearance of impropriety and the need to make proportional efforts to cure it. Okay, so once again, why this half step? If you're saying their apparent dishonesty on the stand creates the appearance of impropriety, then they're both dishonest. Why does one get to stay? They're prosecuting Trump and co., for making false statements. If you think they committed perjury, then say it. And that's a problem. And they should both go. Uh, I hate to agree with Charlie Kirk. He, the man is always wrong. That's, that's turning points, Charlie Kirk. He's a conservative activist. He's, you, can, you can follow him on Twitter if you're a glutton for punishment. Um, the, uh, it's never a good sign to, to support him. But he said that he, that Scott McAfee, is essentially a coward. And I agree with him. I think he wanted to sack both of them, but he didn't have the guts to go through with it. So he did this, or oh, one of you needs to go thing. So that's my take anyway. I think that this that just doesn't make any sense at all. There is another problem, though. 
And this is something you probably haven't heard. This is the next problem. This is the next story in the next couple of weeks we'll be hearing about. The Raffensburger call. Do you remember the Trump calling Raffensburger, the Georgia Secretary of State, and asking him to find 11,000 votes? That's what started off this whole trial. Do you remember that? Okay. I hope you do. I can't hear you. I'm in a studio, a soundproof studio. Apologies. <laughs> the Raffensburger call, where they taped Trump asking for 11,000 votes, may have been illegally recorded. Apparently, it was recorded in Florida. Florida is a two-party consent state. That means for it to be legal, you need both parties to the call to agree for it to be recorded. I don't think Trump agreed <laughs> to, for it to be recorded when he talk, spoke to Brad Raffensperger. So what that means is, I don't think that evidence is going to be admissible. If that's right, if that was recorded in Florida, I don't see how it can be admissible. That's a key piece of evidence. That's the key piece of evidence. Uh, but anyway, that's the next problem. We'll, we'll talk about that again. I just want to flag that, that that's what uh, the scuttlebutt is at the moment. Uh, we talked about the other legal things. Oh, Merrick Garland. Yeah, okay. A couple of weeks back, we spoke about Merrick Garland. And I, because I was, I think I was, I was talking to Bill about this. I was making the point that the, we're in a big rush for the Supreme Court to go through the immunity the immunity appeal, so that way the January 6th trial can happen after that. And I don't think the January 6th trial is going to happen before the election. But people are blamed the Supreme Court for ha having this appeal. And I'm saying, I said, I think the Supreme Court are taking too long to do this, but I think it's perfectly reasonable for them to hear this immunity appeal. There are legitimate legal issues that they need to discuss. i got no problem with that. Um, people have suggested that the, uh, the, the DC Court of Appeals, which was the step before the Supreme Court, took too long to hear the immunity appeal. I think they did a pretty good job. I think, I think that when you look at these, at both, at both levels of appeal and the, the district court judge, the actual trial judge, if you look at all three of them, none of them were too bad. I mean, I think Supreme Court could have been a bit faster, but they weren't terrible. Then you look at the two years before any of this happened, before the, before the special counsel was even appointed. He was only appointed in, at the end of 2022. You look at that two years beforehand, you go, well, what was Merrick Garland doing? That's the problem. That it took so long for them to get started. Okay, I read an article about this, and then I read a few more articles, and Merrick Garland did do some stuff. That's unfair on Merrick Garland. Um, he did a few useful things. In January 2021, the Justice Department Inspector General Michael Horowitz announced an investigation into whether any former or current DOJ official engaged in an improper attempt to have DOJ seek to alter the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. That's code for investigating Jeff Clark, who is central to the January 6th indictment. Okay, so the Inspector General began the process of the investigation that then the special counsel picked up on. So that's the first thing. That was January 2021. You couldn't get earlier than that. Uh, the FBI seized Clark's phone in June 2022, which then uh, Clark, uh, they then uh, Jack Smith could use later on. They got warrants for Clark's email accounts before Jack Smith as well. This is all stuff that they saved t Jack Smith time from. Okay? In April 2021, the DOJ obtained a warrant to seize Rudy Giuliani's phones. In September 21, they undertook a privilege review of materials seized from his devices. This all helps. This is all information they could then use. Uh, in September 2021, the, one of the two lead prosecutors on the January 6th case against Trump, Molly Gaston, subpoenaed associates of Sidney Powell as part of the investigation to her fundraising of false claims of voter fraud. That then got used as well for the January 6th indictment. So a lot of stuff in the January 6th indictment, the legwork happened beforehand. Before, before special counsel was even appointed. So let's give them credit for that. We also need to remember COVID. In 2021, COVID created a huge backlog on all the Department of Justice work in 2021. It took 14 months to bring the first January 6th defendant to trial for exactly that reason. So it was kind of a missing year for everyone. So it, it, more than less than two years of wasted it was one year and maybe not wasted anyway because of the other reasons I'm saying. Also, it was an incredible amount of legwork that had to be done for these cases beforehand. 
According to Jack Smith, at least 25 witnesses withheld information, communications, and documents based on assertions of the attorney-client privilege under circumstances where the privilege holder appears to be Trump or his 2020 presidential campaign. So I had to work through that. And some of that work happened before Jack Smith existed under the Department of Justice, especially given most communication was on encrypted apps like Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp, Hushmail, ProtonMail, they need to seize phones. That takes a long time. That, that, that's a lengthy process. So to give you an example of how complicated this can be, take the tweet that Trump sent on January 6, 2.24 p.m. We all know the tweet. Mike Pence didn't have the courage, he said. Now, to present that in court, you have to show that it was actually from Trump. How do you prove that? Let me tell you how. You need to exploit at least two phones. You need to get, seize two phones. You need nine months of fights over executive privilege. You need a 23-day time-wasting exercise from Twitter before they give you the information you're looking for. And then you need two sets of interviews with at least eight different top aides. That's what they required to just verify that tweet. Multiply that by I don't know how many. It's a lot of work. And a lot of it happened before Jack Smith. Finally, there was coordination with the January 6th committee. Uh, the Department of Justice asked the committee for witness transcripts back in April 2022. The Department of Justice only got transcripts relevant to the Proud Boys trial in December 2022. And they're on the same side. It just takes a while. The fact is, the justice system was not designed to fast-track presidential candidates. It was designed to deal with people who had endless amounts of time. This... Uh, this situation is on voters, not the justice system. Voters aren't meant to nominate people who are obvious chances of going to jail. And the legal system shouldn't be forced to have to adjust itself for that situation, which is entirely unreasonable. The voters are at fault, not Merrick Garland, not anyone else. So, oh, and Trump's at fault as well. So anyway, there's that. Uh, what else we got here? Robert Herr, the bit which Dave didn't want to hear. <laughs> okay, so Robert Herr was the special counsel that looked into Biden's uh, uh, documents, the, 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 the classified documents that they found in Biden's house in a shabby box in his garage. Robert Hur was the one who was tasked to look into whether there were any charges to lay against Biden. He's the one who gave many reasons why Biden shouldn't be charged. And one of them was that he may come across to a jury as a well mean, a sympathetic and well meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I think the quote was off the top of my head. And people, that was controversial at the time, but the Republicans obviously saw an opportunity here, so they got him in to uh, testify the hearing to try and drill down to just how senile Joe Biden is in Robert Hur's view. Remember, Robert Hur was the one who said that Joe Biden forgot when his son died and when he was vice president. They were quite interested in that. Okay, so first of all, let's go to the transcript because they also released the transcript at the same time he had his hearing. Do transcript first, then hearing. Um. Was the memory part, the famous memory part of uh, the report fair when you look at the transcript? I haven't read the whole transcript, but I've read fair, fair wax of it. I'll read you the relevant section of the transcript, word for word, and then we'll discuss it. Her asks about the time when Biden was living at a house in Virginia after leaving the vice presidency. And here are the quotes. President Biden, well, um, I, 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 I don't know. This is what, 2017, 2018, that area? Her, yes, sir. Biden, remember in this time frame, my son is either, ha either been deployed or is dying. And so it was, and by the way, there were still a lot of people at the time when I got out of the Senate that were encouraging me to run in this period, except the president. I'm not, and I, another mean thing to say, he just thought that, that, that she, Clinton, had a better shot of winning the presidency than I did. And so I hadn't I hadn't at this point, even though I'm at Penn, uh, that's his think tank he was at, uh, I hadn't walked away from the idea that I may run for office again. But if I ran again, I'd be running for president. And, and so what was happening though, what month did Bo die? Oh God, May 30th. And then someone said 2015. 
Another person said 2015. And then Biden said, was it 2015 he died? Another person said, it was May of 2015. Biden said, it was 2015. Then another person said, or I'm not sure the month, sir, but I think that was the year. And then uh, Kirkbaum, who's another investigator, said, uh, that's right, Mr. President. It. And then Biden said, and what's happened in the meantime is that as, and Trump gets elected in November of 2017, unidentified speaker says 2016. Another one says 2016. And Biden says, 16, 2016. All right, so why do I have 2017 here? He's obviously referring to something he's holding, some document. Uh, another person says, that's when you left office, January of 2017. And Biden said, yeah, okay. Uh, but that's when Trump gets sworn in then, January. Siskel says, right. Another person says, right, correct. And Biden says, okay, yeah. And in 2017, Bo had passed, and this is personal. The genesis of the book and the title, Promise Me Dad, and then he goes on to discuss Bo's death. Okay, so what we see there is that Joe Biden did indeed bring up Bo's death by himself. No one brought it up for him. He brought it up. He remembered the exact date that Bo Biden died. He didn't ask the year. People supplied him the year. They volunteered it. So we don't know for a fact he didn't remember the year. And then he became generally vague about that year and the year that Trump got elected. Although it seemed the vagueness was related to the fact he was holding a folder or some document labeled 2017. So that was throwing him off. He was a bit confused, right? This is how Her described what I just read in the report. He did not remember, even within several years, when his son Bo died. Okay. I think that's accurate, but misleading. He remembered the date for a start. It's not clear that he wouldn't have come up with the year eventually. It looked to me like he was confused by the folder. That threw him a bit. But, yeah, either way, that I think it's worth mentioning. If you're going to hold that up as evidence of his poor memory, you should at least mention that he remembered the date, I think. Uh, if her was going to go there, I think he should have said that Biden did remember the date. And he also probably should have mentioned the folder as well. That was a bit of a jumble. Um, I also think that what's clear there and clear elsewhere in the end of the transcript is that her should, her should have stipulated that Biden has a bad memory for years. It was years that he kept on stuffing up and not being sure about. He remembered, seemed, seemed a very sharp memory for other things. Um, but uh, he was weak on years constantly. Like... For instance, he, he asked once if he stopped being vice president in 2013. He asked uh, if he was still vice president in 2009. He's not good with years, obviously. Um, but other things he's really sharp on. Like, for instance, page 34 of day two, if you have the document, uh, Kirkbaum asked, I want to see if there's anything else, any other things that you remember about this day. And so the schedule shows that you had an appointment from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m., with some some person. Do you know what that would be referring to? And Biden said, yeah, I had they had operated on my shoulder and it was a workout schedule. Not a bad memory remembering a workout appointment from six years earlier. That's pretty good memory. But um, so, yeah, he had his moments when he was quite sharp. Swallow, actually, Eric Swallow, actually, in the hearing, tried to make something out of another quote from the transcript, uh, which I'll play you now. I now want to turn you to the transcript and day one, page 47. You said to President Biden, you have appear to have a photographic understanding and recall of the House. Did you say that to President Biden? Those words do appear on page 47 of the transcript. Photographic is what you said. Is that right? That word does appear on page 47 of the transcript. Never appeared in your report, though. Is that correct? The word photographic? That does not appear in my report. So her saying there that he, he had, a, his memory was, was photographic about the house, his understanding of the house. Although, I think... To be fair, Her was setting Biden up at that moment. Remember what Her was trying to do. He was, he was trying to show that Biden knew 
where they, he was how he had classified documents. So by him flattering Biden about his incredible memory of the house, right before he asks Biden why he did, why he suddenly didn't remember that box of documents in the garage, you can see what he was trying to do. He was trying to set him up so he could he could use it use uh a Biden's supposedly sharp memory, photographic memory of the house to justify saying that that Biden should be charged because he knew he had classified documents. That's what he's trying to do there. So it's a little bit tricky. Not the Eric Swalwell one to explain that. But to be fair uh, to Robert Hur, uh, Hur didn't mention this, but it's noticeable in the transcript how all over the place Biden was. He was very Mr. Magoo-like. He was wandering all over the place. He was having nice little chats, talking about his cars. He was he, he really was he, was he was the Sunday driver of uh, interviews. Like he really was wandering around. You would not describe him as seeming sharp. You really wouldn't, to be fair. But there were two other elements in this transcript that made me very nervous. That I want to share with you now, and this hasn't gotten much publicity. Recall that the crux of the report was that Biden was on tape at one point in time saying, quote, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, right? And Hur suspected he meant the classified documents in that scrappy box in his garage. If that was what Biden meant and Biden didn't turn that box in, then Hur had enough right there to charge Biden with knowingly mishandling classified documents. So that was the key aspect of this whole report. Uh, but remember, this was the context of the phrase. Biden said, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs. I wrote the president a handwritten 40-page memorandum arguing against deploying additional troops to Iraq, I mean to Afghanistan, on the grounds that it wouldn't matter, that the day we left would be like the day before we arrived. And I said, when we talked about this a few weeks back, that when he spoke about finding the classified stuff downstairs, he could have been referring to that 40-page memo, which he which he was allowed to have because it was regarded as his private notes. So if he was referring to that 40-page memo straight after he said he found the classified information, as if that's what he meant by the classified information, then he gets off, right? Now, thinking, considering that, let's go to the transcript where they're asking him about all this. One of the investigators, a guy called Crickbaum, said, okay, do you remember telling him, his biographer, I just found all the marked classified stuff downstairs. Whoa, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Hang on. Beep, beep, beep. Reverse, reverse. Crickbound said marked classified stuff. I just found all the marked classified stuff. Biden didn't say marked classified stuff. He said classified stuff. I'll read that again and then continue. That's important because if because he, he found marked classified stuff, it's really, really obvious that's classified, which makes him more blameworthy, right? So I'll just read that again. Crickbaum. Okay, do you remember telling him I just found all the marked classified stuff downstairs? Biden. Marked? Crickbaum. Do you remember saying that to him? Biden. No. So they gilded the lily. They tried to get Biden to admit to having seen marked classified stuff. They, they lied to him to try to trick him, and he didn't bite. So either he was too clever, or he's just telling the truth. He had no memory of, of saying any of this. Either way, that was dubious from them, I'm talking about, from the investigators. Okay, then recall, there's more. Their conclusion in the report, for uh, the, 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 at least this section of the report, they said, this evidence provides grounds to believe that Mr. Biden willfully retained the marked classified documents about Afghanistan. If he was not referring to those documents later found in his garage when he told Zwanitzer he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs, it is not clear what else Mr. Biden could have been referring to. It's not clear what else Mr. Biden could have been referring to. Now, remember a few weeks back I said maybe he was referring to the 40-page memo that, that he said directly after that quote they're, they're obsessed with. But anyway, let's continue on. Crickbaum said, 
And I guess looking at, you know, the evidence taken together, one simple theory, I'm just going to ask you if you have anything you want to add when I explain this theory. If the answer is no, the answer is no. Biden says, okay. Quick Bound says, one simple theory would be that when you told Mark Zwanitzer in February of 2017 and you were talking about Afghanistan, that you just found all classified stuff downstairs, what you meant was you just found all the classified documents ever about Afghanistan that were later found in your garage in the lake house. And so we're trying to understand if that's what you meant or not. And I understand you've told us you don't remember, but our question is really if there's anything else, any other memory or thought you have on this that you want to share with us as we try to make sense of the evidence. Biden says, other than only thing I can think of is I was referring to him that I knew of the president, the, the memo I wrote to the president. I didn't want that in use for any reason. Whoa! <laughs> so Biden said, I don't really remember, but my best guess is I was referring to the memos that Biden mentioned straight after. The ones I said that he probably was referring to. Of course he could have been referring to those memos. He said them straight after he said he found the classified stuff downstairs. So just to be clear, he, he, if he found, if he was, if he was referring to those memos, the presidential memos that he was allowed to have when he said that he found the classified stuff downstairs, then there's no case to answer. And these guys keep on saying, no, 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 no. He's talking about the box. He's not talking about those memos. He's talking about the box. Well, they put that to him, that he's remembering the box. And Biden specifically said, no, I was referring to the memos. And then they still, in their report, said, if he was not referring to those documents later found in his garage when he told Zwanitzer he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs, it is not clear what else Mr. Biden could have been referring to. He told them what else he could have been referring to and they ignored that in their report. The transcript really, really exposes, if not dishonesty, extreme incompetence in that respect. Uh, it's obtuse, at least, to the point of self-delusion. It was one of those three. <laughs> so that was really dodgy. And that hasn't been mentioned by almost anyone. Uh, here's another thing that hasn't been mentioned by a lot of people. The Eikenbury bit. I remember in the report they also cited as evidence of Biden's foggy memory. They didn't remember that the ambassador to Afghanistan, Carl Eikenbury, was a strong supporter of his withdrawal plan. When you read the transcript, that section is a mess. I'm not going to read it to you because you won't even understand it. It's all over the shop. It's really hard to understand. It's just not clear what he's saying. Uh, it's totally confusing. And a few paragraphs later, Biden did get right which side Eikenbury was on. So I don't think it's clear that Biden forgot that at all, but they just asserted that in the report. So there you go. So um, in conclusion, I haven't changed my mind that it was generally a good special counsel report. I, I, I thought it was a decent report. Uh, generally it was good, but let's not kid ourselves. These guys were desperate to stitch Biden up. And I've give, given you a couple of examples there where it's really clear they were just being unfair, and they were try, and they were they. In my view, they were either intentionally trying to stitch him up, or they were so motivated to stitch him up that they were cutting corners and being dodgy. Um, that uh, and so it says something how weak the case against Biden was. That her thought he couldn't find a way to indict Biden. I also think the memory bits could and should have been worded less definitively. But anyway, so that's the transcript. Now let's get to the hearings. Did the hearings yield any useful information? Well, they were the opposite of useful. Uh, the Republicans were interested in everything but hers report. Uh, the Democrats, uh, well, they, okay, they, um, Jai Paul tried to verbal her into saying that he exonerated Biden. They were really interested in getting her to say that he exonerated Biden, which... Of course, he wouldn't let them have that. Um, so she just kept talking over him, saying that he exonerated Biden. It was pretty sad. Let me have a look at this. So this lengthy, expensive, and independent investigation resulted in a complete exoneration of President Joe Biden. For every document you discussed in your report, you found insufficient evidence that the president violated any laws about possession or retention of classified materials. 
The primary law that you analyzed for potential prosecution was part of the Espionage Act, 18 U.S.C. 793E, which criminalizes willful retention or disclosure of national defense information. Is that correct? Congresswoman, that is one statute that we analyzed. I need to um, go back and, and make sure that I take, take note of the word that you used, uh, exoneration. That Mr. is not Herr, a word that I'm going to continue report, with that's my not questions. Part of my task as I'm going to continue with my questions. I know that, that I the term. I ultimately reached I know that whether the term, sufficient evidence existed such that the likely you outcome you, you exonerated would be a conviction. Him. I know that I the term willful that retention report, has a. Mr. Hurd, it's my time. Thank you. That is pretty indicative of how tragic this hearing was. Uh, there was also a vague insinuation from Eric Swalwell that her was angling for a sweet appointment by Trump. And you want to be received as credible, right? Um, that would be helpful and laudable, yes. Well, a lot has changed since 2018 for the person who appointed you, former President Trump. Since you were appointed, uh, he was impeached for leveraging 350 U.S. 350 million U.S. taxpayer dollars over Ukraine to get dirt on President Biden. He was then impeached a second time for inciting an insurrection. He was charged for possessing classified documents and obstructing justice. He was charged for paying for the silence of a porn star. He was charged in Georgia for his role in January 6. He was charged in the District of Columbia for his role in January 6. He owes $400 million dollars to the state of New York uh, for defrauding the state through his taxes, and he has been judged a rapist. You want to be perceived, understandably, as credible, and so I want to first see if you will pledge to not accept an appointment from Donald Trump if he is elected again as president. Congressman, I, I don't, I'm not here to testify Seems like an easy about answer. what will happen it's in the considering future. Considering what I just laid out. I'm here to, te- I'm here to talk about the, the report and the work yeah. that went into it. And but you I, don't want to be associated with that guy again, do you? Congressman, I'm not here to offer any opinions about what may or may not happen in the future. I'm here to talk about the work that went into the report, which I stand by. That's a bit pathetic as well. It's unlikely her's going to get a sweet, sweet appointment from Trump. Uh, her is the one who oversaw the Mueller investigation. Don't think Trump liked that much. Um, there are a lot of ha- uh, attempts to say, what about Trump's cases? Which is fair enough. I don't mind them saying that. They'd, it is important to draw that distinction. Uh, Ted Lieu, I thought, did that very well, actually. So we'll just play that. In your investigation, did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to lie to the FBI? We identified no such evidence. Okay. Did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to destroy classified documents? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to move boxes of documents to hide them from the FBI? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to delete security camera footage after the FBI asked for that footage? No. Did you find that President Biden showed a classified map related to an ongoing military operation to a campaign aide who did not have clearance? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a conspiracy to obstruct justice? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a scheme to conceal? No. Each of the activities I just laid out describe what Donald Trump did in his willful mishandling classified information and his criminal efforts to deceive the FBI. In contrast, President Biden handed over documents without delay and complied fully with investigators. Mr. Hur, in your report, you write that, quote, according to the indictment, Trump not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it, end quote. You also say that if proven, these would be, quote, serious aggravating facts, end quote. Do you still stand by your analysis? I do. Okay. I thought that was a pretty good job from Ted Lieu. Uh, A number of people simply started playing montages of Trump seeming senile just for the hell of it. It was just a waste of everyone's time, but sure, I guess they wanted to get it on TV. I think Eric Swalwell literally said at one point in time, I now want to show you and play you what is definitely not photographic after referring to the photographic memory quote from, uh, from her. Uh, and then he just played a minute-long montage of Trump being senile with no question afterwards. That was it. At the end of his time. There you go. There's Trump being, being, uh, being a dotard. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Amusingly, that actually seemed to be the only thing in this hearing that actually interested Trump. Trump, uh, Trump truthed out, the Her report was revealed today, a disaster for Biden, a two-tiered standard of justice. Artificial intelligence was used by them against me in their videos of me. 
Can't do that, Joe. Sadly for Trump, uh, there was no intelligence in those video montages whatsoever, artificial or otherwise. Uh, okay, the Republicans, they tried to get her to say that Biden was senile. Good luck with that one. This is Scott Fitzgerald. Webster's Dictionary defines senile as exhibiting a decline of cognitive ability, such as memory associated with old age. Mr. Herr, based on your report, did you find that the president was senile? I did not. That, that conclusion does not appear in my report, Congressman. There was also this suggestion of scandal that the White House tried to remove the memory section from the report at least twice. Uh, here's this bit there. So is it correct that on uh, that February 5th letter uh, that was sent to you asking you to change um, uh, references to the president's poor memory? Wasn't there a request by the White House to do that? There was a request, yes. And didn't the White House then um, go to the Attorney General himself and say that he would like to see changes to the references in regards to the President's memory? The White House counsel did send such a letter. Now, to me, that's good governance. They made self-serving requests. Those requests were refused by Robert Hur, and they did nothing about it. They didn't punish him. He didn't have to face any consequences. They just moved on. Good. That's how it's meant to work. I don't know what the scandal is there. That's that. They should be proud of that process. But the critical exchange involved Robert Herb versus Adam Schiff. Shifty Schiff. This is where he. This is where Dave was going to talk about him looking like the hamburger or Mayor McCheese or whatever. Uh, it's on. It was about whether it was appropriate to include the memory language, and this was a serious exchange. Like I actually think Schiff made some fair points here, although I disagree with him a little bit, but it wasn't bad. Um, I'm going to play not the whole exchange, but most of it. Uh, this is, if we've got the time, I'm getting near the three-hour mark here. Do you understood your report would be public, right? I understood, based on comments that the Attorney General had made, that he had committed to make as much of my report public as consistent with legal policy and uh, legal requirements. And you could have chosen just to comment on the president's particular recall vis-a-vis -a, -vis a document or a set of documents, but you decided to go further and make a generalized statement about his memory, didn't you? Congressman, I could have written my report, theoretically, in a way that omitted references to the president's memory, but that would have been an incomplete and improper report in that, that it did wasn't not my reflect question, my analysis though. You could have the written, explanation of my decision. You could have written your report... General. With, his, with comments about his specific recollection as to documents or a set of documents, but you chose a general pejorative reference to the president. You understood when you made that decision, didn't you, Mr. Herr, that you would ignite a political firestorm with that language, didn't you? Congressman, politics played no part whatsoever in my investigative steps. But you understood decision, nevertheless, the words didn't you, that I Mr. Herr? Mr. Herr, you, you, you cannot tell me you're so naive as to, to think your words would not have created a political firestorm. You understood that, didn't you, when you wrote those words, when you decided to include those words, when you decided to go beyond specific references to documents, you understood how they would be manipulated by, by my colleagues here on the GOP side of the aisle and by President Trump. You understood that, did you not? Congressman, what I understood is the regulations that govern my conduct as special counsel. And, and those regulations, regulations those regulations, me to write a confidential report for the Attorney General, which you knew would not be confidential, my and that is what I did, Congressman. Mr. I followed you, the rules. You knew it would not be confidential. Followed them. You knew it would not be confidential, didn't you? Sir, the regulations required me to write a confidential report re explaining my decision to the Attorney General, which you knew would be released. It was up to the Attorney General to Which determine you, you understood what it would be released. Did you would not? be released consistent with you, DOJ policy. You understood it would be released. You understood it would be released. I understood you? from the Attorney General's public comments that he would make as much of my report public as he could consistent with legal requirements in DOJ policy. And you policy. also understand DOJ policy that you are to take care not to prejudice the interests of the subject of an investigation, right? That is generally one of the interests that DOJ policy requires that prosecutors respect. And it was your obligation to follow that policy in this report, was it not? It was also my obligation to write a confidential report for the Attorney General explaining completely but my what decision. what you did write was deeply prejudicial to the interests of the President. You say it wasn't political, and yet you must have understood. You must have understood the impact of your words. 
You must have understood the impact of your decision to go beyond the specifics of a particular document to go to the very general, to your own personal, prejudicial, subjective opinion of the president, one you knew would be amplified by his political opponent, one you knew that would influence a political campaign. You had to understand that. And you did it anyway. I need to address something that you said in your prior question. What you are suggesting is that I needed to provide a different version of my report that would be fit for public release. That is nowhere in the rules. I was to prepare a confidential report that was comprehensive and thorough of an What is in the rules, Mr. Hur, what is in the rules is you don't gratuitously do things to prejudice the subject of an investigation when you're declining to prosecute. You don't gratuitously add language that you know will be useful in a political campaign. You were not born yesterday. You understood exactly what you were doing. It was a choice. You certainly didn't have to include that language. You could have said vis-a-vis -vis the documents that were found at the university. The president did not recall. There is nothing more common. You know this. I know this. There is nothing more common with a witness of any age when asked about events that are years old to say, I do not recall. Indeed, they're instructed by their attorney to do that if they have any question about it. You understood that. You made a choice. That was a political choice. It was the wrong choice. You can draw your own conclusions. You can say, you can decide whose side you are on there. I personally think that Robert Hill is correct, that memory was part of his process, and so he should have referred to the memory. I just think he should have been more specific. I think the vagueness, ironically, the vagueness of his description of the memory was unfair to Biden and painted an inaccurate portrayal of what was in the transcript. But what was in the transcript was not great. So I think he should have mentioned it. But Schiff probably wouldn't have been happy with what I would have written, but what I would have written would have been different. So there that is. And uh, I don't think we even did a Stats Nugget today, did we? Oh, no, Stats Nugget here. Yeah, stats, stats Nugget. nugget. Yeah, stats nugget. nugget. It's actually, my source here is Melina. I trust Melina so much that I am going to just cite her as a source. In the past quarter century, more than 300,000 American children have experienced armed civilians attacking their schools. That's an amazing number. 300,000 American children have experienced armed civilians attacking their schools in the last quarter century. So there you go. Amazingly, I still haven't gotten to the funny state business involving Flores Don't Say Gay Bill and the Newsom Panera scandal, which is now a, it was even in this cycle. It, I think it might have been before the midterms. It's been so long since I talked about that, which I like. It's, I'm going to get to it next week. We got one more un Chaz Unleashed, and I'm going to clean up as much as I possibly can, folks. You know that is my particular. That's my personal mental affliction. I just have, can't leave things, let things go. So um, I will see you guys. Thank you very much for staying to the end of Pep 150. Bit of a relaxed Chaz Unleashed at the end. I wasn't very unleashed. <laughs> it was quite leashed, really. Um, the uh, hope I gave, hope we gave you value. And uh, stay tuned for next week. We're on Tuesday-ish. We're going to have Richard Cook. And then Thursday-ish will be... It'll be a good Friday. It'll probably be a good Friday by the time I get it out. It'll be a good pep, hopefully. For pep 152, that will be. I'll see you guys next week. Until then, stay peppy. Toast.